only holiday worth celebrating. Hello there, internet. Welcome to Progress Day, the most consistent Legends of Ontario podcast out there. And as you guys can see, we are four this time around as your boy Swim is back. I, I had to go with your boy. I'm sorry. How's, <laughs> how's it going, man? I'm great. It's, it's good to be back. We've got uh, me with the hair, lobster with the mustache. You know, someone, someone Photoshop those two together. It's going to look completely horrible. I love it. <laughs> I don't want to see what that looks like. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I'm actually <laughs> and, I and saying that immediately. <laughs> It, it could be the new Poro. Think about it. I, I, uh, I more, possibility. I envisioned Heiberdinger and Brahms child. So yeah, that would be a bit <laughs> yeah. interesting. Okay. So, uh, yeah, what we're going to be doing today is quite simple. We are, this, this is going to be posted at exactly the time as the patch notes go out because, uh, we did get, uh, prior access to it. So we are going to be discussing for however long this video is going to take because it's going to be quite a bit of rambling because we have so many balance changes to talk about. And uh, Panda wanted me to just kind of like give you guys sort of uh, a rundown as to why we're here. Though I think most of you watching know exactly why we're here. You know, June was an interesting month for Legends of Runeterra. Uh, the state of the game was, um, you know, fun. Uh, it, it, as, as they implied for the blade data mechanic, which we all love. Uh, fantastic play, uh, play patterns and uh, overall an interesting meta that has uh, led to one of the most anticipated balance changes, I think, ever in this game. And this is crazy. Like we have, I, I, don't, I haven't even counted all the changes, but I think it's well over 20, right? Like this is absurd. So yeah, yeah for anybody watching and uh, wondering, why this balance patch has occurred, then you can give them the rundown panda since you were the one I wanted to do it. <laughs> well, the main reason I think from this patch, I think even last patch, there was already necessity and, and just maybe the most anticipated patch already because we, there was so many things that were very, very clearly broken and overtuned and really oppressive in the meta. And the meta was, was really suffering a lot. And the devs did not deliver. They, they really dropped the ball completely. And I think the, the backlash was justified in that in that sense. And this patch is kind of a reflection of that. They knew they had to do something drastic, maybe risky, you know, in some ways as well with some of the changes they've made, but they knew that, you know, 20 or 30 changes were necessary. And we talked in the last progress day episode with, with Lobster and, and Mogwai how um, they could make so many changes, you know, so many small changes that we are going to see in this, in this balance patch where it's cards that were completely underplayed that you add like plus one attack or, or you know, a stat to try and maybe narrow down so that the, the power level of all the cards in the game are somewhat closer together in absolute value. Yeah. And we, we did see a lot of that happening in this, in this balance patch. We're going to go over it, of course. Um, it's a lot of changes, but like I'm saying, some of them aren't going to be the most consequential changes. They're just small stat changes that might make a card not that much stronger, but at least someone seeing this balance change might think, okay, this card exists. I just, I forgot about it. Let me just try and build a deck with this. And, and at least the perception is going to get better. And I think diversity and experimentation will also improve. So although it's a lot of balance changes, it's not that many are that important. I think there's maybe like 10 or, or 12 really impactful ones. And the rest I think are just adding into like the bulk of the patch, which I think was also necessary because some cards are just completely dead uh, for, you know, the entirety of the game cycle. Well, actually, uh, oh, sorry. Go one ahead. thing to add as well, yeah. just mm -hmm. something to kind of keep in mind as we're going through these, which is that some of these changes are reversions to older yeah. cards, like cards getting uh, kind of unnerfed. Uh, and some of you guys, you know, the initial reaction might be, oh, this card used to be OP. It's going back to that state. Uh, the game has changed a ton since then. And honestly, I'm, I'm going to say I do love a lot of these changes. Yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of like necessary for keeping things viable. And this state of the game, the meta is just going to keep these kinds of things from being as strong as they once were. But before... The reverting of these changes, just quickly to mention, yeah, yeah, yeah. also is, is, is kind of an easier balance change to make because you already knew what the card was like in that original state and you don't have to play test you don't have to think about you know these outside scenarios that might be a kind of, obviously there's new cards and, and maybe that impacts a bit but these are changes that are kind of already tested in some ways you know where that power level yeah. was before the game as a whole a zero relia etc the power level has increased drastically and then the power creep has increased drastically so now these these changes these reversions um you kind of have a lot of information about how that was before and you're not that scared or you know of making these maybe sometimes risky changes because of how important and how big this balance patch is as a whole, I just want to say that before we jump into it, uh, for anybody watching, the reason why I wanted to tackle this balance patch with a progress day episode is because I think it's really important for uh, us to show like all, four different perspectives from 
Uh, you know, we have uh, con fellow content creators here, uh, top level players, washed up casters. It's, it's the entire package. And uh, I think uh, we have some very interesting, uh, you know, opinions. And it would be nice to, to debate some, some of the potential impacts that these changes will bring to the table. And I feel like it's going to make for a very interesting discussion. So I'm happy that all of you guys could make it. And uh, let's go ahead and just dive into this. Because like I said, I believe this is the most crucial balance patch in the history of Legends of Runeterra. And uh, there is a lot to talk about. But I do agree with Swim. I'm, I'm very optimistic with uh, a great portion of it. So without further ado, we're going to start off with the champions. We're going to go in the same order as the balance uh, patch notes are. Uh, they will be in the first line of the description down below in case you guys want to check them out yourselves. Let's start off with Miss Fortune, which, like Swim mentioned, is just a full revert. She went from uh, getting kind of like nerfed out of nowhere back in the day, which uh, it, it was considered to be a house cleaning sort of decision to take away the, the overwhelm from her leveled up form. And now she gets it back. What do you guys think about this decision? A pretty big deal, honestly. Uh, I mean, this th you could really feel it when this nerf came through because the overwhelm was just part of like how that deck was winning games. Uh, I love it. I think Bilgewater has been, you know, Bilgewater is kind of one of the topics we're going to be mentioning here. It was really weak for the last month, and I'm glad it's getting more love. Lobster? Uh, yeah. Um, it also enables multiple archetypes. And I've barely saw play recently. I do think it does benefit the scout deck. It benefits pirates burns. It maybe even benefits MF Irelia, which might not be as overtuned of a deck as Zero Irelia now used to be. And I overall like this change very much especially in accordance with the other beige water changes that we'll see in a second. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think we can mention it because it is obviously the, the, the champion spell of Misfortune. And I think it's it's a pretty important thing to mention while we're talking about Misfortune, the, the make it rain revert that has happened. It's a bit lower in this balance patch from three mana to two mana. This, these are things that are paired together, I think. Um, obviously, Misfortune with Scouts, that was her main deck. But I think now with the make it rain revert with cards like Monster Harpoon added as well with kind of reasons to experiment with Bilgewater and find maybe control shells even, or, or mid-range control shells. She's a champion that I think can see play just from a pure value perspective of this is a three-mana champion that has this, this you know, plunder effect as well that helps with Monster Harpoon mm -hmm. and other cards that there was very little plunder synergy happening in the game because Bilgewater was at 3% play rate because oh, okay. there was no reason to play it. But now with Make It Rain Revert as a, just a general anti-aggro tool, just a general very good value tool and Misfortune, that being a champion spell as well, I think it's a pretty big deal. And I think there might be a control archetype where Misfortune can be in even just as a, as a kind of a Draven type three drop is just very good value. And if you don't have a better champion slot, if you think Gangplank's not really worth running something in a deck like that with Monster Harpoon, that's a guaranteed plunder, for example. So I think it's a big deal. Um, I'm not sure how important the Overwhelm is overall with a level two, especially outside of scout decks. Maybe with the Make It Rain, you know, Reaver, I don't think you had to change Misfortune as well in the same patch because it's, it's already a big oh. deal for champions full, but it's not a bad thing either. I think it's fine. It's not going to be that consequential. I, I, I do want to talk about make it rain a little bit more when, when yeah. we actually reach the card, because I feel I, I, there are definitely some implications it being a misfortune signature spell, but it's one of those rare cases in which the card is like really detached from the champion really in, in the decks that they are mm -hmm. more often than not run. And uh, the make it rain nerf has massive implications, especially for a lot of decks that I personally love playing. So we'll, we'll dive into that as well. But it is true that it is her signature spell, and it is also an indirect buff to her as well. Uh, the next mm -hmm. champion I want to talk about here is... I think this is a crazy buff, personally. I think this is amazing. Jarvan the Fourth got... I don't even know if this was necessary, to be fair, but uh, I'm just going to read it. It got changed from four strikes having uh you have to survive four strikes with allies from enemy blockers and now it's basically 25 percent less now it's just uh three strikes if, if your allies have survived three strikes from enemy blockers jarvin will level up perhaps one of the champions with the biggest change in power level from his pre-leveled and his post-leveled form you know like leveled up jarvin is is legit i've been playing a lot of uh jarvin shen i really enjoy that mid-range deck it's in fact the one that i personally used to reach masters this season and uh, I, I really don't believe this is necessary, but I, I think this is a big deal. What do you guys think about this? This is a massive buff, in my opinion. Yeah, it's huge. And, uh, I, I, you know, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of the top decks, slight spoiler alert, a lot of the top decks are getting nerfed across the board. And what that means is anything that's getting buffed in an environment where a lot of the, you know, meta-stable decks are coming down a bit is going to be even more impactful. What do you think, Lobster? 
Absolutely agreed. Uh, it's the second Jarvan buff almost in a row as well. We had yeah. that stat buff earlier on. And I do think that uh, the idea behind a lot of these balance changes is to make mid-range more playable again. It kind of fell out of the meta again, especially Demacia kind of lost its identity as a stat-driven mid-range region. And I think this enables a lot of um, mid-range archetypes again, some types of Bannerman decks where Jarvan can be great top end, where it's worth going for the level up and just generate crazy value, which the decks are often lacking in the late game by generating the Cataclysm every turn. It uh, it's, can be a very impactful change for sure. And I think part of the buff is also just, you know, Fiora was nerfed in the past, you know, two patches ago, and that was a big hit to Demacia, to yeah. reasons to play Demacia, to, you know, viable decks you can play. Especially, you know, the, the Shen Fiora deck was kind of obliterated. It's been a stable for a very long time for a reason. And this is maybe an incentive now for people to, to once again pick up Shen Jarvan, like you're saying. Maybe it's too strong, but I think there are some buffs that have to be, you know, uh, like very clearly strong to, to bring people into, oh, let me play this again, let me try this again. And it was a very popular deck for a reason. I think people did enjoy that deck, even though Fiora, you know, maybe had some more problems, but I think Jarvan has a six drop and just the way it plays out, I think it won't be oppressive, just possibly, yeah, very strong in, in how it plays out. But I haven't played Jarvan too much. I think, Mongo, you have a, a lot more experience. So I'll take your word on it being a, a very, very strong buff. I, yeah, I, I just I just believe that, you know, I'm not implying that Shen Jarvan is tier one, but I do feel like some people jump the gun a little bit when they say there's just a strictly worse version of Shen Fiora. Like, I think it has a lot going for it. Jarvan synergizes super well with Shen and with the Green Glade Caretaker. And... Uh, actually... No, oh, yeah, go, go, go. No, I, I'm... I, I was just gonna say real quick. I'm, will, I'm willing to say that I, I think Shen Jarvan will be tier one after this. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, because... after the, after this buff, yeah, I agree completely, yeah. completely, completely. And, and it has a really good interaction with Swift Swing Flight as well. The new yeah. Challenger card. It'll be really easy to level Jarvan with all those challengers. And Swift yeah. Swing Flight actually buffs Jarvan when he comes out too. Yeah, that that, that was on... the one revealed in the uh, the uh, season or the Korean Asian season, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. Uh, challenger bird that buffs other challengers on the attack, and because yeah. of the order of operation, Jarvan actually comes out and then gets buffed by this. Oh, that's bird. sick! Mm -hmm. That's sick. And like like Swim mentions, other things, other nerfs happening. Uh, we'll see some nerfs to Ezreal Draven that might also impact a deck like Shed. Yeah, like, you know, Shen, yeah, good or Shen yeah, Jarvan good really coming up again. So yeah, yeah. like Swim mentioned, I think yeah. that that's not just like the power level of the, the big three, you know, Azir Rally, the mm -hmm. obvious thing, but just also direct counters and direct, you know, matchup counters also being nerfed would, would definitely help Demacia as a whole. Awesome. Let's go ahead and move on to the next champion, which is, uh, I, I, this is a fun one because, okay, so Trendemir is the champion that I am least experienced with. Like there was actually like this post of like champions that I played on Reddit and it actually shows that I've, I've only done like one video with Trindamir ever because I, I don't know. I've never really been drawn to this champion. So I, I know very little about this guy, but I would go ahead and assume that this is not a very impactful change. It gains tough now. I believe this is a revert unless I'm mistaken. Yes. It is, yes. right? In, in the, mm -hmm. the pre-beta, the like play testing, he used to have tough. Yes. Okay. And wh why did they take that away? It was too good, I guess? I, I think, yeah, yeah. I guess back then in, in the little test periods, they felt it might have been a little too oppressive. What do you guys feel about things, this? Things have changed drastically since that time. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think an 8-4 tough Trindamir is not is not on the power level of... Oh, but it's level so. two. It's, it's, when it's the only when he gets level two. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be no fair, it kind kill of him with like the... nine vile feasts. Yeah. <laughs> It kind of fits thematically, though, right? Uh, yeah. Considering how he's supposed to be in League of Legends, Undying Rage, hard to take down. But realistically, in a meta that's as sped up, sped up compared to what it used to be like back when Trindamir was played, it's probably never going to matter. Like, if Trindamir gets killed, he usually dies to a Vengeance or a Renation, or he just gets perma-frozen and the game ends in some other way. I mean, have fun trying to take down a 10-10 or a 9-9 on the board through pure damage. And this is, again, part of these changes that I mentioned of them making changes that aren't going to make this champion suddenly, you know, become oppressive or very, very played. But they're thinking, you know, why not? This is obviously not going to make it too oppressive. Let's just give it a little bit more and give people at least a reason to try it out to maybe get some more play rate. And to even if it's a minor amount, just add a little bit of, of power to it so it's closer to that, you know, neutral absolute of all the cards are coming in and as power creep ha is happening as well so not a risky chain not much yeah. to talk about but definitely i think a good thing to, for it to be a little bit stronger at least i i definitely think it's safe to assume that it wasn't the lack of tough but you know the fact that he got a bit outclassed by nasus as an atrocity target and by tlc as a shadow isles 
pro your control deck, right? I, th I think those things have a little bit more to do with Trindamir's Fall from Grace than uh, not having tough at level two. But, you know, I mean, it's better than nothing. And, uh, you know, I, I played a bit of Malphite myself because uh, I am a bit of a masochist and I did actually find a lot of scenarios in which the tough, as redundant as it seems on such a big unit, does matter. And when a lot of trades are happening, like it actually, it, it does, it does do something. In, in fact, uh, let's move on to the, this one's really, really interesting because it's not the only Ionia change. Uh, in fact, we were calling so much for Bilgewater bus, but I feel like I, Ionia got the better. Uh, yeah. Like they got so, so many things. Oh, and it's, yeah. it's very clear that they want to make Karma great again. She has been, again, another revert back to five mana from six. I really want to hear you guys' opinions on this. Do you guys think uh, Targan Ionia Karma is going to make a, a comeback? Or how do you feel about this? Because there's a lot going on for this. Obviously, we can't, you know, we'll, we have to talk about other stuff like the Will of Ionia revert as well. Uh, maybe you guys can include that in, 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 in your argument if you wish. But because I'm, I'm really uh, interested to see what you guys have to say about this. So, I mean, for me personally, I think that Karma is definitely going to be competitively experimented with for mm. quite some time. And yeah. I, I think most of that just comes down to the fact that they are nerfing pretty they are nerfing pretty much every tier one and tier two deck across the board right yeah. now, um, which I personally think is an amazing thing. I think yeah. that's that's great. A lot of people uh, in Magua, you and I were literally talking about this a few days ago. The golden age of Runeterra was kind of like the like the sort of like Bilgewater Sejuani uh, area. Like, July last was year. Just, yeah, exactly. It was like almost. We, exactly we talked about it and we jinxed yeah. ourselves. We said this is a, this, it's only gonna go downhill from here, <laughs> and it did. I remember that <laughs> there was, perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> there was there was a ton of diversity. Yeah. And amazing. I, I I just like the thing is that diversity was spurred on by a similar balance patch where a lot of top things got nerfed across the board, yeah. right? And so there's going to be like anything that's surviving or like getting buffed, like it's going to be a just a drastic paradigm shift. And Karma, I think, is absolutely back on the table for that reason. But Lobster, what do you think? Okay. That change is very interesting. I think Karma has always been dependent on the meta. Um, there was only one time it was really a meta definer as Karma Ezreal, I would say. Spooky yeah. Karma was always only an answer to the meta. And since Ezreal is not what he used to be anymore, <laughs> they did our boy. But... Um, Karma, I think the idea is to give Ionia an identity of a control region again, which yeah. kind of fell short completely. It got overshadowed by a lot of other regions like Freljord and uh, Shadow Isles. And uh, Ionia was only used for their well, combo and aggro tools in recent times. We all know the Aurelia kind of package. And I think Karma is going to be playable without being overtuned here. Because I think the meta is still going to be too fast for her to really shine. Um, I think a lot of games are still going to end around turn 6, 7, 8, 9 before Karma can really pop off and take over. And she still needs some time to get going after you hit turn 10, yeah. right? You usually need one or two turns to regain control of the game. Um, but it's de it definitely makes her more playable and more of an option to experiment with. Yeah, I agree. Especially with the Will, Will of Ionia revert, I think it is also a big deal um, as a, as one of the, the premier tools um, for playing Ionia. You know, that, that obviously denies and, and notifies, but also uh, the recall effects at stopping. You know, we'll see a Hecarim buff later on, but things like Hecarim and Nautilus coming down and getting that, that tempo advantage back was always a big deal with even the Heimer decks back in the day when I was playing when Deep was a thing when it first came out. It sucked playing against Heimer because of Will mostly. Like it just felt like you were just three turns in a row trying to play Nautilus, and every time you're just bouncing it back to your hand. Um, but like like Lobster said, I think it is going to be a reflection of the meta. I think you can't just, and I think this is how it should be for these very late game control decks and for aggro decks. You shouldn't be playing them as a default, I think, and they shouldn't be the main part of the the meta. I think we we're talking about the, the mid range meta being yeah. the golden time, and that's where most of the decks are going to have a lot of interaction with Ezreal, Draven, Demacia, a lot of back and forth, and really highlights the best parts about Runeterra. Whereas TLC or Zero Relia highlight the worst parts, at least for me. Um, and I'm, obviously, they're very extreme cases, but I think that's why this meta was so bad as well, because of when the high end decks are the prevalent and the most you know strong things in the meta. It already, you know, immediately just erases 50% of, of what you can play competitively on ladder and you can't even play it because the power level of these, you know, polarizing matches are so strong. So I think Karma is fine if it, 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 like this buff is good, but it's not going to become like the TLC control, you know, 
takeover thing now. It's still going to be an answer to if there's a lot of aggro and, and you want to play karma and you have all of these control, you know, Eye of the Dragon and healing tools, you can play it in a tournament, maybe in lineups, like it's, there's going to be a better reason to play it, but it won't become, and again, I think this cost thing, it, it was never really that relevant back in the day either. I think the Will of Ionia nerf was a bigger deal to karma decks and stuff like that because you never play karma until the late game. And I mean, it was relevant, but not that relevant. I think it's not like the yeah. biggest deal reverting this. Yeah, well, it is important to consider that, like, it being, like, Karma being one mana less does give you always, like, more mana to defend her with when you play her. Yeah. Like, always uh, having more more mana available in the turn you commit her is is always really important. And it is true, like, a lot of times when she got nerfed, like, she, she was very dominant at one point, And when she went down, like, yeah. she cost six mana, a lot of us underestimated the impact it's, of the I was just going to say that, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I think this is a bigger. This is a big deal. I, I think um, it, it. I do agree. It definitely depends on the speed of the meta. But if we do venture into a mid-range meta, and some games take a little bit too long, then Karma will dominate. Because in the late game, uh, I've never seen a more dominating champion uh, than Karma. I mean, you can argue the Watcher, right? But it's 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 kind of like a different case right because the watcher is just doing one thing it's just like okay if i work i, I kill you but i'm talking about games which drag out and become value wars you just cannot outvalue karma there's, there's just no such thing yeah exactly. and uh, and having that you know that position as like the the queen of of late game is uh, is strong and if the meta allows it she she can be super prevalent so i i'm i'm gonna keep my eyes on her and i think there's a lot of players that can really figure her out and 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 breaker like uh, game breaker for example has had a lot of success with some some uh, karma target variants with uh, Zoe. He's even played karma Lee Sin. I don't even know how you do that <laughs> to be honest. That seems kind of weird to me, but it, it, he's made it work, right? So with this revert and the will of Ionia and other Ionia uh, changes that we've seen, uh, I do believe this this could be this could be pretty legit. But time will tell. Next we have. Uh, we're going to start talking about some nerfs here as we have another Ionia queen, but this one, uh, very, very different uh, sort of champion as Irelia is going to have her level of, level one version, sorry, nerfed as her level of requirement changes from 12 allies or more having attacked to 14. So I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm not an Irelia Azir expert because I, I, I don't have as much experience with the deck myself. Um, I... Playing against it, I do feel like this is a substantial nerf, even though it seems like it's very minor at yep. first. Um, though I do believe the one that we'll be talking about, Azir, is overall more impactful. But what do you guys I, have to say I um, think we about should, this? I think we should probably talk about them both together. Okay, yeah. Let, let me just mention the other one real quick. Yeah. So just so you guys know, Azir uh, is a little bit down there. Uh, he's also been nerfed. He, he requires you to summon 13 units instead of 10 to level up. And I do feel like this one, this is actually a bigger nerf than uh, many people, I assume, will, uh, you know, read it as at first. Because this is a big yeah. deal. So, yeah, we can talk about these two together. What do you guys think? Absolutely. I mean, especially now that, you know, Inspiring Marshall has been nerfed and people are running uh, Golden Lady uh, instead. Oh. But they'll yeah, I haven't played this game a lot. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, this last month has taken a lot out of me. But, yeah, people are playing Golden Lady. Uh, instead, and yeah, I mean, she's going to be harder to trigger because, of course, you know, the level up requirements. Uh, I, I I agree with you that these these are pretty noticeable nerfs for sure. Like the deck is slowing down and it, it no longer is it a combo deck that can kill you at aggro speed. Um, it's just more like a combo deck that threatens inevitability, which is kind of what it was supposed to do. My only I question is, with, with, so with the Azir nerf, uh, do you guys like the change in the unit requirement or would you guys not have preferred a health nerf to four instead of the five health it has now? It's a good I question. I honestly do think that both could have been done. Yeah. I think it's important not to over nerf things, but just yeah. in, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the theme of keeping in mind a lot of the top decks coming down, I don't think it would have been an over nerf. What I partially dislike about the Azir nerf is that it also hits uh, other decks collaterally, decks that were not even playable in the first place and are yeah. even less competitive now, something like Mono Shurima, which obviously the game designers wanted to work. And yeah. also something like Shurima Burn is uh, going to have a significantly less uh, chance of leveling Azir consistently. And uh, therefore, Nerfing Azir overall instead of only hitting the interaction does feel a bit weird. Mm. That would have happened with both of those changes, though. But the Irelia change, yes, it does matter quite a bit. 
I think a lot of people felt like the the dex power level overall didn't change after the martial nerf because of course there was the Aurelia bug fix, right? Mm. And she <laughs> got the blade surges earlier on and more consistently. And this should slow the level up and the blade surge spam and generation by like half a turn or a turn, by like one blade dance or one attack. And um, that gives the other deck significantly more time to right. stabilize. Get that big blocker out, get the fury unit, the lifesteal unit out, have more mana for combat tricks. And yeah, it's like slowing down a, a deck like Relia Azir by a turn or two is gonna completely exactly. shift the meta, to be honest. Exactly. It'll still have the same like weakness. Uh, it'll still have the same strength matchups as before, but now it'll actually lose to stuff like aggro like it was kind of supposed to properly do. Mm -hmm. What were you gonna say, Panda? I asked about the health because what the lobster's talking about. We talked about this in the last progress day, and we talked about it when people were complaining about Azir, and I, you know, mentioned this as well. Uh, the fact that it not, it's now 13 units, it, it you know, Hecarim Azir is not going to be a thing. Uh, Lucian Azir is not going to be a thing. Uh, and aggro, it was already kind of you weren't. It wasn't like the star of the deck in Trina Burn, but now even less reason to run it, I think. Um, and it just feels bad. I think it wasn't. I think making it for health provides interaction, makes removal spells important. It, it, you know, at five health, there's a huge difference from four to five health. Like it's so unattainable for every region, basically at that, at the time it comes down that I think the health was the biggest issue. I think mm -hmm. putting it down to four health would have been fair. Maybe also changing the units, uh, 13 units is a bit for me, looks a, a bit weird. So maybe like 12 and, and four health, maybe that's too big of a nerf, but Azir was very strong. And I think, uh, the unit change just makes it so that, yeah, it can only play with blade dance now, um, in terms of level two. You can yeah. still play it as level one in other decks, but it just doesn't make that much sense. I mean, ultimately, by making the health uh, lower, it makes it easier to remove. But it's also important to know that there are decks that just don't interact as much and, and will not be able to remove Azir anyways. So I, I like the fact that they slowed down the level up just because uh, that's the big like swing, really, in mm -hmm. Azir Aurelia. When Azir levels up is when the deck's power level just spikes. Because without that level up, the Sand Soldiers are much, much easier to, you know, uh, take on. Like, I'd much rather face uh, an Azir Irelia that only draws Irelia than one that only draws Azir, personally. Because you can draw other Bleed Dance triggers and everything. And I feel like Azir is really, because of, of how he synergizes with Bleed Dance... Uh, he is like the biggest threat within the deck, in through my experience, and and slowing him down because his level up is really what makes things crazy. Uh, is um, I, I feel like it's 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 better than uh, it's certainly better than nothing. But I, I do agree that you know they could have also made him weaker, uh, or they could have potentially even done both. Um, I'm just it's also one of those things that I I feel like. <laughs> You know, I'm not a psychic, but I, I don't know, man. Sometimes I feel like uh, the devs don't really want to admit that Blade Dance has been very problematic. <laughs> you know, like, I just, I don't want to go there, but it's just like, uh, I don't think anybody would cry if this, this archetype got nerfed to the ground. But at the same time, uh, we have to believe that there are people who, I mean, it is a fun deck to play. It's not a fun deck to lose to, but it is a fun deck to play. So they want to keep that around, and it's recent, but I, I do feel like... Um, Basically, I want an apology letter from Riot. <laughs> so, having that said, um, we're going to move on to uh, a, a slight Riven buff. Uh, so, basically, what changes is that, is that she reforges now when she is summoned as well, if you have the attack token. I don't know, ultimately, how relevant this is, because if you play her on Curve, for example... Uh, this means that in order for you to make use of, uh, actually, never mind. You keep that. You keep that card in hand. So never mind. I'm, 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 I'm being dumb. I, as if you, as if the card was fleeting. I was thinking about like blade dance cards for some reason. No, no. Yeah, it's actually a pretty, a, a, a pretty good buff. Uh, what do you guys think about Ribbon? Because could, could this actually make her a little bit more relevant? Because it oh, feels yeah. like on paper she has everything, right? A good stat line, you know. Oh yeah. No, I, uh, I love this buff. Yeah. I, I'm in love with Ribbon right now. I mean, I, I spent like i think an hour and a half yesterday just like going through card for card and building a uh riven draven field promotion deck uh which i actually think Ooh. is going to be like very zero irony i actually uh, see a ton of potential in this deck um and even like you know uh draven riven ionia with, hmm. with like Luria fist like the older style of playing that archetype i think do very well i i love this change people have been calling it out for a while just you know because it, it kind of makes sense as how irelia works and it just feels like it's how Riven always should have worked. Yeah. 
I think Riven's power level is passively going to increase anyway by the top decks uh, being nerfed and mid-range decks mm. having more breathing room overall. And this is a, a, just a tidy buff, but it is significant, like Swim said. Um, it's going to give much more combo potential. It's going to give more, uh, like, yeah, interesting playmaking potential. I very much like this change. A champion that looks good but has been underplayed and hopefully will soon have the time to shine. I think the perception of, of a champion was lower than the actual power level. I think it has been played in the past, you know, two months. Uh, maybe not Riven actually, but there, there were like Draven uh, Vi decks that that had a similar game plan to Riven. If, if maybe she was a bit better, she would be the one in that deck. And it was a, a deck that I think some some American streamer played to Masters with a pretty high win rate. And I think overall, it's one of these changes that because it gets changed, people want to experiment with it. And when they experiment with it, they they find out, oh, this, this card's actually not that bad. Um, I think it's going to be part of it. And yeah. I think all the reasons you guys gave also will add to the power level. One question though, when it says with this change, does it mean it still gains the reforge on the next attack token or just yeah. on summon? No, okay, no, no, so no. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's an it's addition. A, yeah, it's an addition. It's like, it's like, it's like how they buffed Victor a while back by okay. giving him the summon. The wording is a bit, is a bit weird. Yeah, so but because you have to have the sure. attack token. But I, I like what Swim said, like it makes sense because I really uh, is how, you know, it really does this, you know, like when she's summoned, she, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so why not? So why wouldn't And Riven? Draven as well with the axes. Yeah, it makes sense. exactly. Like every other champion does it really. So uh, the, the last time I played Riven was when the new skins came out and uh, I played some Riven Lee Sin with Flurry of the Fist. And honestly, I, I, I do feel like uh, the deck, yeah, I, I've always felt like Riven is, is good. It's just that it's it's one of those weird cases where she it feels like she has everything going for her like with her stat line and everything and and but ultimately she just could not overcome the perfectness as a three drop that Draven is you know that, yeah. I think Draven this is, this is her time that. Riven is stonks yeah okay <laughs> so all right I'll, I'll tell you I'll, hey I I'll, I'll believe it I I think I think she and I, I could also see her being just underrated or overlooked for for a while as well because she's yep. there's nothing really bad about her really and 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 generating spells like it's one of those champion designs one of the reasons why Draven is so universal as well is because by generating spells there's so many different strategies and archetypes that you can combine with like you're not stuck to something very specific you know like they're she's she's very interesting and she's she's really this is definitely a, a great buff and i'm looking forward to uh, messing around with her as well let's move on to uh a, a change that i'm you know it's it's more basic but i'm very excited for personally because i love this champion and it's been a while since we've seen him and that is heimerdinger getting buffed from one three to two four now i know that there will be people who say as long as heimerdinger doesn't make three mana elusive turrets he's not gonna be good again and this could be true you know uh but this is better than nothing like now he survives a lot of stuff um it's still funny to compare him to an engine like azir having more health than him but ultimately it's safe to assume that heimerdinger does have more snowball value potential right uh i'm a big fan of heimerdinger i have been ever since you know i started playing this game and uh, I, I i love seeing this buff just because it'll make him a little bit harder to remove will the meta still be too fast for him uh probably but I'd like to hear what you guys think. I think uh, I think I'm one of the people that might say, as long as Heimerdinger doesn't make <laughs> elusive three mana turrets, he won't be good. Again. My brain agrees. My heart doesn't. I just I I want to believe it. But yeah, fuck. <laughs> he's he, I mean he's a little bit less removable, but the speed of the game has just you know picked up. Still at like five mana, just like starting to generate units. I think is gonna be a bit too slow. But you know you can see him as like a one or a two of splash and like some. There's a lot of like Targon PNZ decks that can just kind of run, you know, champions flexibly. And you can see Heimerdinger slide in there. I do think Heimerdinger is a very tough card to balance because if you make him too durable, he can generate infinite value, yeah. kind of the same way that Karma does, but way earlier, mm. starting on turn five. So if you stabilize against any deck and you stick a Heimerdinger, he's just going to solo carry the game. And uh, that's why I do think that one HP is very impactful because... Heimerdinger, when he has been played, has usually been played with like Targon or um, Ionia, hmm. and they offer a significant amount of protective tools as well. So um, it's going to be much easier to buff him outside of the range of Black Spears, of Ravenous Flocks, of Merciless Hunter, uh, the best champion in Jurima, uh, threatening Heimerdinger. And even a Pale Cascade will do. Also paired with the. Um, with one of the Ionia buffs to Twin Disciplines that we'll see later on. Who knows? Maybe there's some potential there. But yeah, Heimerdinger's glory days are sure gone. The elusive turrets were the main reason he was that good. And uh, he might, I think he might be like tier three playable, but not much above it. 
Yeah, I think the power creep of the game, removal spells, the way targeting came out, that's like kind of the better value generator for the late game with invokes, etc. I think it just got outclassed. I'm not sure how much this will change, but it is a step in the right direction. I think it was completely dead champion and, and giving it something, you know, plus one, plus one stats is relevant. So maybe it does matter. But overall, like Swim said, I think the game has changed so much in the past year that I can't imagine, you know, a Heimer deck being, being anywhere close to, you know, competitive. All right, let's move on to other, you know, not so relevant champions getting a bit of a stat boost here as we got Hecarim going from a 5-5 to a 5-6. So basically, ultimately more statted than he was uh, when he was deemed OP. But it's important to remember that when he was at his prime, Hecarim would spawn 3-3 uh ephemerals and not two two ephemerals which was a big deal and but even so the game has progressed and, and just changed in such a way that i don't even know how that hickerman would fare in this meta regardless he is uh very well statted now for what he does he's a five six uh, having that one extra health um it, it definitely does go a long way how do you guys feel about hickerman does he have any do you guys expect this to have any sort of impact do you think there could be a deck for him <laughs> nope, no impact yeah, I can't say with I disagree. The, with the Azir Revert especially, makes that archetype that I know you were playing a lot when, when Azir first came out, mm. makes it less appealing. Will of Ionia to four makes it less appealing. That was Hecarim's always one of his big counters as well. And the fact there's so much, so many more stuns in the game, stuns just completely shit on Hecarim. Exactly. But when he comes down for six mana and then a stun happens, it's just your entire game plan's over if you don't attack on that turn. So just out of, you know, the it, the environment around the Hecarim and, and also the changes happening, to Will Bionia makes it, I think, irrelevant. It basically makes some experimental meme decks stronger, but it's not going to impact the meta. I, I highly doubt it. Yeah, I, I think that's all we can say about, about Hecker. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a fall from grace. It's a bit sad, considering he was, like, at one point, he was, everybody was complaining about Hecker. It was like, oh, God, another Hecker in deck. How, how the big, how the mighty have fallen. Let's move on to arguably one of the most predominant faces within shadow owls based decks and uh, one of the kings of the one of the big three basically of this metagame and a a nerf that i think is really important nasus no longer has fearsome in his level one form this has so many implications like uh, all of a sudden uh, chump blocking him earlier and it's not even about being able to block him easier it's also being able to about to use a very weak blocker and potentially ping it yourself to prevent the level up like there's a lot of things that this leads to and um i think this is honestly i i'm a big fan of this nerf like i've, I've always thought nasa's thresh is a cool deck but the problem is it's a bit too good especially it was supposed to be nerfed but then merciless hunter happened and i i always feel like if it got toned down a little bit because i still want it to be playable and i think this is a correct way to do it what do you guys think yeah, I, I think so. Panda really kind of struck it earlier when he was talking about wanting to nerf top decks without nerfing like side options for those decks. In talking about Azir, right? You want to nerf Azir Aurelia without nerfing Azir with other things. And I think they've kind of hit the nail on the head here. They've kind of successfully nerfed Nasus Thresh because that was the one deck that could really utilize its level one fearsome. But I mean, Nasus is still just as playable in decks like, for example, I don't know, Mono Shrima, which some people run him in. So mm. this is a really nice change. And like you mentioned earlier on, Mogwai, it just gives you much more interactability if you play against Nasus. You have more playmaking potential, you can stall a bit better while feasting your own 1-1, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, that's the core idea, like one of the core ideas behind LOR in general yeah. is the interactability. It's one of the game's strongest facets, and I just think that's a great change to improve this. I think the biggest change to Nasus won't be this one, will be more, you know, we'll see later on changes to the Slay Pack. I think that's, the, that's what made Nasus such a problem. The fact that you can get to 10, you know, Slay so quickly with how efficient it was and how it was already quite efficient, but then it just got so much, so many more tools in the past uh, few months. And that's the biggest thing. But yeah, I think it's definitely a small thing that will, will be relevant. I do think that the Scarab debuff on level two always struck me as like something that was very strong and not that necessary i'm not sure if it has to be a board wide debuff i always thought maybe just the single the, the highest unit on it's, your opponent's it's side. a big pay but I, I do like it because it's a big payoff uh, for the level up for getting that strike yeah, through thematically it, feels, it is it nice thematically feels cool too i yeah. I, I really but like it, i always felt 
whenever yeah. it leveled up, especially at the beginning when it first came out, and I kind of forgot about this the scarab debuff. I always thought, really, like, are you gonna <laughs> have to give off my entire board as well, a minus one? Well, well, but yeah, yeah, I think this is this is a fine nerf. As no, well. but it's a good point. But what I like about that is that it also makes it so that you know uh, a big unit doesn't just have to be elusive or overwhelmed to be incredibly threatening. You know, like it really. Mm -hmm enhances you know fearsome man I, I i love that aspect of nas like i had more of a problem with the spell shield right uh yeah. that i did with that deep buffer and, and i agree with you guys completely though i i really really like this change i still think the champion and, and fresh nasses will be playable uh though there is another nerf later the line that that definitely will impact the archetype a lot but ultimately i i i definitely agree this was an ideal change next we're going to move on to sivir i'm going to be honest i don't know what it is about this champion but i don't really care too much about sivir uh, personally like i i just know i, I yeah <laughs> sivir I, did it you Mogwai. i don't know i don't know what it is man but it, i mean she now now she levels up easier uh whoop de doo what what do you guys feel like she she I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of agree. She's a little, she's a little bland. I do think this will definitely have some uh, some competitive implications, though. Um, mm. You know, people are talking about you know field promotion Sivir, which uh, I think is actually Ooh. pretty sweet. People Ooh, have been yeah. you know running Sivir more in like you know Demacia decks. Oh, uh, to note, to the promotion on Sivir, she can't share the scout keyword. Um, that's unfortunately the order of operations is wrong on that. When she levels up, okay. it'll like uh, she won't get the reattack on the entire board, but. It's still really nice on her because she has spell shield and quick attack, and she'll level faster with the field promotion. So, still a very good combo. The level up is such a huge payoff. I do think it's going to matter combined with the fact that Sivir is also wants to see a mid range meta and is most effective in mid range decks. I do think we will see much more play, and I think the, the power level of Sivir is going to increase. I do believe she might be very dominant. She is very tough to deal with. And she can't just be a catalyst to snowball the mid game and close out games quickly. Yeah, I think it's not a huge change, but it's a change that obviously makes an already playable champion that much more attractive to, to experiment with, to try out. We, we saw Garen Sivir in the U EU seasonal, and we saw Sivir with Renekton in, and Demacia uh, with Team Poland in the EU Masters as well. So it was already a champion that was being brought and being considered in tournament environments as well. I think now it's just a, a minor, minor thing, but still makes it that much better. Uh, and definitely will make it playable uh, and yeah i think we're quite competitive as well i i love uh what, what you mentioned uh earlier so with, with the field promotion because when i was talking about that card uh i saw that people say well field promotion with zed and yeah initially that's very appealing the problem is you're spending five mana for something that can just get mystic shot right like the biggest downside to field promotion is you have to commit it prior which exactly. uh, can lead you to not only a, a card advantage loss in an exchange but also a massive tempo loss as well yeah. so pairing it with a spell shield like spell shield is just the, the best spell shield in quick attack it's just, it feels like it's just it's meant to be like she may end up being like one of if not the best card to combine with a field promotion mm -hmm. and i could totally especially we've already seen versions of demacia shirima with Sivir. Uh, played at a high level we saw like with Renekton and stuff so it makes sense like the region combination already makes sense and I do definitely think that that could um, that could be pretty like actually top tier potential even so it, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out because that's one of the most interesting cards that I've seen from this like reveal up until now yeah. like field promotion I think has a lot of implications but also it, it can be a glass cannon as well so it's an interesting card regardless uh, we're gonna move on to Talia who got buffed again you know, eventually they're just like, you know, I, I understood the requirement of Talia uh, having to have a landmark on the board to get like her three rocks. You know, it makes sense. You, you need to be in a land. I don't I, I'm not going to yeah. even try to. But yeah, basically, I, I get that's the matter aspect of it. Uh, but at this point, they're just like, you know what? Let's just let's just take this out. And I, I, I I'm happy they did, because ultimately, uh, I don't feel like Talia ever really needed this setback, like yeah. requiring you to have a landmark to actually go off. Um, how do you guys feel about Talia? Will she finally, you know, be uh, relevant after this? I think that, I mean, her her biggest problem has always been just the support cards, the landmarks themselves mm -hmm. are super awkward, Agreed. super bad. That being said, she will hit uh, Thralls decks. I, I expect that uh, Frozen Thralls will be very good, uh, probably like tier two. And Talia will definitely find a home in those decks as she has. I gotta admit, I only found out like one or two weeks ago that that was actually a thing that like you could only cast one of those shards because usually you will always have a landmark on yeah. board if you play a Talia deck. And that's why I think this change does not really matter. It's 
like one out of 20, 30 games where that actually makes a difference. It's still a, just a neat little change. I do like it. And yeah, why not keep trying to make Talia playable? Yeah, nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, all right, let's move on. So Tarek is, uh, I guess, Shen 2.0 at this point. Got the Shen stat line, which is sweet. Uh, ultimately, Tarek still has the weakness within his design, and then that is that you need to commit a card to him prior to attacking to find good value, which can leave you a little bit wide open uh, when it comes to mana, right? Like when you have to pre-commit a spell upon attack, uh, especially when you're facing, you know, some some more reactive decks, uh, you know, you, you find value out of out of Tarek, right? But there's a lot of things that Tarek needs to get going. Well, Shen is more natural in his flow, and I do feel like that's what's been holding Tarek back quite a bit. But this stat gain is very significant. Like, yeah, four mana, three five, and even if you don't apply a spell to him, he's he's sharing tough as a keyword with with his support unit. Uh, I feel like it's a, it's a nice buff. Um, I don't know if it'll really end up making a difference, but I, I still am a big fan of Tarek's interaction with the Aegis Barrier, uh, as it is a very powerful one. Uh, and it did, you know, it did make the Tarek Jarvan combination uh, pretty appealing, you know, until Shen Jarvan came around and, and proved to be more consistent. But w what do you guys feel about this minor buff to Tarek? And do you guys think there will ever be like a solid competitive tier two deck potentially for a champion like Tarek? I don't think he'll be hitting a tier two deck uh, quite yet. This will be a noticeable buff. I think the the biggest flaw with Tarek is you, you sort of alluded to it, um, mm. which is that you kind of want to run into with Demacia, but at the end of the day, like Demacia will end up with better options, so yeah. you'll kind of end up wanting to cut him for Shen or you know one of a few things. He really isn't bad though. It definitely will make him feel uh, better. Yeah, even a four mana three five vanilla stat line is not too bad. It allows him to trade more aggressively into aggro, which used to be a bit of a deal, a yeah. bit of a problem for the archetype. Um, ultimately, Tarek gets better and better the more cards get added and yeah. the more deck building opportunities you get. And I, th I agree with Swim entirely. I think he's not quite there yet, but maybe in the future you get enough consistent combos, enough consistent payoffs off of the Tarek passive for a playable Tarek deck. And this is a champion that, again, was one of the most underplayed historically that came out, was very, very underwhelming. And giving this stat change is not going to make it oppressive, but it's going to at least bring it a little bit closer to the power level, make some people try and experiment with it. And, and you know, I think these are changes that should be happening. Not just this balance patch, but every single balance patch from now on, there should be changes like this, where you just add a stat here or there, things that are completely dead, yeah. and see if that helps with something. If it doesn't, then you can, like Talia, getting two buffs in a row, maybe seeing, you know, you see how that works out. If it doesn't help enough, then you can add a little bit more. Yeah, it's important. Also, a quick note, in, oh, in the bug fixes, it mentions a fix to this Golden Aegis, Double Taric, Infinite. There was a video on Reddit a while ago. They fixed this, so you can't do it anymore. Which is like you give one Taric Golden Aegis, and then it gives it the effect to the other one, and then you attack in the opposite order, and you have like infinite attacks, basically. Uh, okay. But, but this was changed. Not yeah. a relevant thing, but, but just to mention. Yeah, like a, yeah, a meme, one in 100 games scenario. Yeah, it was so very like, hard to pull okay, off. But... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. but because uh, I, I do like the interaction with uh, with the Aegis Barrier. And I, I do just want to like <clears throat> reinforce what, what you guys just said. Like I, it, there's a lot of changes that, you know, we're saying, oh, this is not going to have an impact. But I love seeing the, these changes. Like I, I, I think this should happen regularly. Them just tweaking numbers here and there because sometimes there can be something that that doesn't seem like it will make a difference at first, and all of a sudden it's it's all the card like ever needs. Sometimes it's just a number, man. Like people don't people have a, a an easy time forgetting that this is a game of numbers at the end of the day, and just a slight stat boost can can make or break a card. So or or a mana cost as well. So I'm 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 all for. It. I hope every I, I wish every balance patch was like this. Honestly, just want to clarify that. We got uh, the last champion though. As we move on to the uh, the follower spells and landmarks is Aphelios. Aphelios is gonna be uh, a three three again. But ultimately, the biggest thing with Aphelios was uh, like when they. I, I can see. You guys. <laughs> well, I, I I know I know when when they changed it like the moon weapons is what really effectively killed the card. Like it is yeah. it is in, insane how much of a difference it is when the moon weapons are two mana when the moon weapons are two mana the card is just fundamentally busted when they are at yep. three he just feels horrible so it's uh and and you will say well you can still synergize with tribe even probably later well sit down timmy i got some bad news for you we'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually oh no but uh yeah i i mean he's better than before 
But it is true that, man, three mana moon weapons are just... They're tough. They're tough to, like, play. Like, it, it's... Yeah, even with Veil Temple shit. I don't know. What do you guys have to think about... What to, to say about Aphelios, rather? Every time I see a bad Targon card, I just smile a little bit inside. <laughs> I liked him, though. <laughs> like, yeah, man, that's all. <laughs> to be honest, like... There might be one purpose for Aphelios, and that is you try to bring triple Targon to a tournament, and you already use all the good champions, and you just have to be happy That's with sad. something. And then, yeah, bringing Aphelios and not having him Mystic Shot on the spot is actually something you're happy with. But overall, it's not going to impact the game a lot at all. I cry with that. Agreed. <laughs> all right, top tier analysis, boys. Let's move on. And this is one, okay, this is one we've got to talk about for a bit, okay? This well, is a big one. For the for the card changes, I think we're in agreement that it would be best for you to read out all the changes for a region, and then we yeah. comment on on the bulk of that region as a whole. Okay. Or else, you know, all we'll right, be here yeah. for a all few right. hours. All right. I mean, we so have Global, yeah, four we, changes. We, we, we have a few more to go through. Okay, so let's let's uh, tackle. This is a big bounce. Back. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Let's start off with Bilgewater, which features, uh, like I said, a change that I'm I'm really really excited for. I think we we're all calling for as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's mention all the cards. So um, in total for Bilgewater, we have the uh, Make It Rain uh, being reverted from three costs to two costs. We've got Black Market Merchant, who goes from 2-1 to 2-2. Another revert as well, because you're wondering. Slotbot with a, a buff that was not really a thing ever before that says that on summon now, uh, alongside the round start effect, on summon, you grant him plus one for each card you drew last round, and then you shuffle his power and health. So he gains the, st the stat boost the turn he comes in, which is a, it's a massive buff to the card. And uh, yeah. I believe that's that's all for uh, Bilgewater, correct? Yes, because mm -hmm. yeah. there was like a Demacia one in the middle of these. But uh, yeah, there's, so there's three changes to Bilgewater. We were asking for Bilgewater changes, and even though we only got three, I think these are going to just be absolutely massive, specifically the first one in Make It Rain. Hey, but Double up is a Bilgewater card, my way. Double up. I, I thought I thought it was the. Um... Oh no! I, I, I you, you know what card I thought this oh, was? Double up. You mean redoubled Dub valor? Right yeah, then, I thought it was redoubled card. valor. Okay, no, double up is the one that steals a follower, right? <laughs> no. No, no, no. Six okay. mana. Double up. Six mana. Deal it. two to an enemy. If this kills it, deal four to the enemy. Oh, the ball. Exactly. Oh, the yeah. ball. Okay. The okay. So shot. double up got got also. Buffed. I mean, yeah, I even forgot this card existed, honestly. It was that irrelevant. So <laughs> Yeah, no, truly. De definitely. Um, yeah, going to be interesting to talk about that one because I, I didn't even prepare for that. I, I thought it was a different card. <laughs> so uh, we can talk about that too. I just want to say what I want to say like about Make It Rain and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on my way. <laughs> so I'm really excited uh, for this change, naturally. Um, when it comes to like my favorite competitive deck... Personally, has always went has always been Twisted Face Swain is the one that I've always feel the most um, experienced with because I really like the archetype. I love Swain as a champion, and I, I Bilgewater is my favorite region. So combining those two, I, I just really love the play pattern with uh, powder kegs and everything. And I feel like make it rain, uh, especially with like there's a lot of implications for this now that we've seen this new light em up card that spawns a powder keg at burst speed. So you can actually uh, enable, like for four mana, you can enable like these empowered make it rains uh, in response to an open attack, for example. I feel like this this change is gonna have massive implications against Azir Irelia playing this alongside the new Harpooner card, for example, allows you to like, the, the difference between three and two mana uh, allows you to uh, do this in the very key turns, enable the plunder, deal some damage, and then Harpoon, for example, in Azir, uh, I think uh, this is low-key going to empower Bilgewater against Azir Irelia if it were to remain prevalent in the meta. And uh, it's going to bring back... I think this just change will single-handedly bring back Twisted Fate Swain to a, a very strong position, potentially Tier 1 even. And uh, not only that, like Ezreal kegs with... Uh, I, I want to experiment with the Dreadway as a win condition, you know, and... and it's it's such an amazing change, and I, I think we, we can all agree it was much needed. And this change alone will bring Bilgewater back into the scene, in my opinion. And the other three are exciting, like Black Market Merchant. I mean, the problem is Pilfer Goods is still three mana. So it's... Um, but but it, it does definitely make a difference. Like, the, the guy can actually, like, block and it's, it's harder to remove. Uh, double up, I'm going to let you guys, uh, you know, talk more about that one because I don't, I don't know if this card... Uh, you know, the fact that it was six mana to begin with, which is kind of 
crazy, right? It reminds me of these Shurima slow speed spell six mana cards that they're printing around, which I just don't even understand. And then, um, and Slapa, like I said, massive buff. So what, what do you guys think about these, these, not three, but four, to my surprise, village water changes? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I was go. like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> I think uh, they're really good changes. Uh, well, specifically, the make it rain change. I completely agree with you, Mogwai. I actually, I said something like a month ago, I really hope they make make it rain two mana again. And, you know, a lot of people disagreed with that because a lot of people had, you know, experiences with Bilge Water back in that day. But Bilge Water got nerfed on so many different axes since then. And it's a very different meta environment. I think Make It Rain is kind of integral to how Bilge Water functions as a region. It's like their auto-include core spell that's supposed to hold the entire region together. And I just, even though I was one of the ones calling for a Make It Rain nerf, like, way back in the day, I, I think at this point, like, the region, especially since the new cards it's gotten, don't really help support it either. The region just needs Make It Rain at 2 mana, and I'm really glad they're doing that. I don't, I don't have much to say about the others. No, no, I, no, no, double up, <laughs> PPHD rant. Okay. Oh, double up still bad. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I agree with them here on the make it rain revert. Revert. I think one of the reasons why people were calling for it in the first place was the Ezreal interaction. But when we had pre-nerfed Ezreal, mm. and that was broken. Yeah. It was broken. But yeah. now that Ezreal is not as overtuned anymore, arguably. Um, this is exactly what Bilgewater needs. And I also agree with Mogwai, this is going to enable TF Swain to come back. It benefits from this patch in a lot of ways, actually. We expect to see more mid-range. TF Swain is a good answer to mid-range. Yeah. And we we'll also expect to see less Targon, not only because of the nerfs that are going to come up, but also because mid-range is good into Targon. And that means your boat, your Leviathan, can do its thing without getting Equinox for one mana. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Um, also... So basically, Bilgewater right now is only deep, or sometimes some Smork decks. Make It Rain gives it a lot more versatility, also playing reactively, having tools against aggro. Mm. Black Market Merchants trying to get the Plunder archetype back. And uh, yeah, Double Up doesn't matter, quite honest. <laughs> and Slotbot also doesn't matter, but you can splash it into some decks without feeling like an idiot. <laughs> I think you can um, play it in certain, like for example, Casino used to be a thing once. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Jinx, Jinx Fizz, Jinx Twisted Fate, depending on how you build it, that just cycles through your deck super fast. And mm -hmm. their Slotbot could be played and it could be like a tier three-ish deck, maybe. Swim does agree. <laughs> yeah, I think Make It Rain is obviously a massive, I think the most important change. Maybe some of the nerfs, like the Watcher, are more important, but in terms of buffs, probably the most important one in this patch, honestly. Um, because, like Swim mentioned, and, and I mentioned very aggressively in the last progress that we did, I talked about this revert as well, I think being a key you know, thing to, to give build to give people a reason to play build water. It's like kind of like the same as impactful as Ballistic Bot in PNZ, where it it's a card that that opens up so many deck building possibilities that makes you want to play plunder again that makes you want to play kegs again that makes you want to play that makes you have a reason to play build water if, if aggro is a big thing in the meta you have now a control tool for aggro like it, it's a, such an important card to have at, right. at two mana as a staple card the same way we have civil combat the same way we have troll channel like these are cards that, that enable so many things because they're they're stronger than average not oppressive but still stronger than average so i think it's, it's super important um i'm very excited to also you know Maybe it makes Monster Harpoon. I think is a very cool card. Just having this as a way to to have a reason to play Monster Harpoon and try and find some kind of build water control deck this patch is something that I'm excited for. Yeah. And super key, super key uh, buff, I think. Black Market Merch Merchant, not so much as a nab tool, but just as a general just value to drop at 2-2. Two, two. I think it can be fine in, in some kind of a plunder deck um, that's not racing, to, that's not racing, it's not, it's just trying to control the board a bit and, and just a kind of a fair mid-range control deck. I think it could have uh, a spot in this possibly all right so let's move on to the demacia changes we have a total of three uh i didn't see any of these coming the first one i think will be the most impactful as it, it, it not because of the card itself but because it is a signature spell of shivana we have confront going from three mana to two mana we got mage seeker insider going from a four three to a four four which will make him effectively a six six after his requirement is met. And Lauren Bladekeeper, this is an OG 4-drop that I forgot about, um, going to become a 3-3 three, three now, which um, I think will be more relevant than some people may think. I mean, it, it yeah. is a pretty, it's a pretty Actually. strong buff to the card, honestly. Uh, but I feel, I feel like the, the most impactful one is, is Confront, just because it is Shivana's signature spell. 
And uh, we are seeing uh, Shivana Dragons as a very prevalent archetype in this meta. That if the meta slow, like it's a very strong mid range deck in general. Just combining Demacia with Targon has always been really solid. And uh, making this card cost two mana, like uh, that, that's pretty big. Like giving a, uh, granting something challenger, I feel like that's a, a very very strong buff to the card. And I wonder what the reasoning was for it. May Seeker Insider, I don't know. Um, it was always the, the, the least relevant one. Uh, in my opinion, out of all the mage seekers, and he's just like a, a big, strong pile of stats now, but you have to play a six mana card prior. I don't know if that'll be enough to like bring in the mage seekers again in, into relevance, but I, I, I do feel like perhaps the most overlooked one out of these is, like I said, the Lauren Blade Keeper. Like having a 3 3, blocking to fearsome, straining into two drops easier, and just that three power just does a lot. So, how, how do you guys feel about these? Which one do you guys feel is actually the most impactful one? out of these uh, very, very fringe Demacia changes here. Yeah, I completely agree on all fronts. Uh, fronts? I completely agree on all fronts. Uh, I think Laurent Blade <laughs> Keeper like, is... Oh, my English is bad. <laughs> I was like, what is that word? <laughs> it's contagious. Contagious. Uh, <laughs> but Laurent, Laurent Blade Keeper is a, is a low-key card. I've, I've added it in actually just like a lot of decks in the last year and a half, um, you know, because I'm always playing like random, you know, Fiora and that, that kind of stuff like Demacia mm. all in. I'm literally... The, uh, the Riven Draven field promotion deck, I I'm actually already running Laurent Bladekeeper in that deck, even before I saw that it's getting buffed to three attack. So that just goes to show, yeah, Bladekeeper, I think, is uh, is a little bit low-key in my seeing. It'll still see it need specific decks like that to make sense, yeah. but I really love these changes. Do agree. I felt like Bladekeeper has been on the verge of bla being playable for a long time, mm. but never quite found the right deck or um, like the right purpose oh. to fit in but right now either with some impactful three drops like zed or fiora or just even in a shen deck maybe even shen jarvan you always kind of had a bit of an awkward turn four situation if you didn't draw shen you didn't really have great four drops besides him like laurent chevalier kind of fit that purpose but you were not super happy to have to include it most of the time and blade keeper is a great option i agree that mage seekers are probably still unplayable I'm actually curious about your opinion on Confront Panda. Personally, I feel like the card is still too situational. I don't see a real fit for it. But the change from three mana to two mana, like a literal 33% cost reduction, is kind of big for a card. Yeah. I think it'll be most impactful, like like my wife said, is because it's Shivana's spell and because Shivana's already being played. Although we'll see some target nerfs that maybe make dragons a bit worse. Uh, so uh, maybe that balances itself out. Um, as to, like you said, Demacia has so many good challenges already that I think you kind of, you know, if it was in a different region that you can really abuse this in certain ways, but I'm, I had to really think and see if there's any, you know, follower that can really abuse this, but I don't think there is that you don't already have, you know, in Demacia already, just default with Challenger, like Street and Dragon, for example. So I don't think it'll be super relevant. Blade Keeper is a card that I think was already good stat wise and, and looking at just a face value in a vacuum was a decent card and it was played in Lucis way back in the day. And this is maybe not so relevant of, an, of a buff where it's now broken, but now it gives people a chance to try it. Like, you know, Swim was playing it and maybe, you know, oh, this card got buffed. Let me put it into this deck. Let me try it. And maybe it finds a new home, which I think would be nice because it's a card that has been dead for, you know, since Elusives uh, got nerfed, basically. I mean, back in the day. J just the idea of, of like Lauren Protege turn three into turn four Blade Keeper, like that, that's really yeah. strong. Yeah. Like you're getting yeah. a three, three and you're bumping that guy to four, six as a challenger. Like that's, that just seems wild to me. So it's, yeah, I, I, I think out of the, these three, the, the Blade Keeper is, is definitely the strongest and that we're going to see. Yeah, I, I think it definitely justified I me mean, in quite a few decks. If you have like any decks with like challenger that's trying to curve out and stuff, like now all of a sudden he trade, like I said, the fact that he, like the the buff from two three to three three just means that he he eats other two threes you know, and uh, that's that's a big deal. But now we're gonna move on to Freljord, uh, because there's only two changes to Freljord, but I th these are in massive changes in my opinion. I think this is a crazy buff to Howling Abyss. Like whenever you reduce the cost of a card, you can you cannot underestimate how much, of, of a, especially with a late game win condition as as this right. Ultimately. I, I haven't played Howling Abyss in a long time, but it is a card that eventually will snowball value and, and just allow you to overwhelm the opponent, especially when you pull, you know, the crazy uh, things out of it. The fact that it comes one turn earlier is, is a big deal, right? The question is, uh, are there going to be any relevant decks that run this as a win condition? Uh, because, because the meta does need to slow down, obviously, for that to happen. But nonetheless, I feel like it's 
it's undeniable that it's a really strong buff. Like going down one cost, like we've seen that make or break cards in the past. And I think it's a, it's a massive buff to the card. Uh, will it make it relevant? Uh, I, I don't know. But I will be messing around with it as it is a, it is a strong alternate win condition for Froyer, which I like. You know, I like being able to make a Froyer control deck and have a, a different win condition uh, than most. But ultimately, the next one is the big one, though. It's, it's a little bit below, but it is a Froyer one, so I will mention it here. And that is the Watcher. This was one of the, like, alongside uh, some reasonable bans to uh, Irelia Zier. For me, it, this was the most important one. Like, I needed yeah. to see this card nerfed uh, because TLC is one of the most oppressive decks right now in the game. And uh, this is... I, I think this change is brilliant. But for, for those of you watching, basically, they changed the watcher so that now uh, I cost zero if you have summoned five or more allies that cost eight or more this game. And on attack... You obliterate all but three non-champion cards in the enemy deck. A Maokai treatment, ladies and gentlemen. This is really impactful for several reasons. At first, it doesn't seem like a, a that big of a change. But ultimately, because because the first thing that comes to mind is, well, this doesn't stop the, the pillar into fading memories. Uh, or just the, the level up on Lysandra followed up with a, a Spectral Matron playing the Watcher from hand. You don't really care if the Spectral, if the Watcher costs four or five initially, because you'll be able to spawn him with Spectral Matron at first. But what matters here is that you cannot play Spectral Matron into the Watcher, and if the Watcher gets answered, you won't be able to fade in memories that Watcher to create more copies of it, and you won't be able to play the one in your hand for free. You need to play another 8-drop on top of that. This slows down the archetype significantly. On top of this, you are not getting your full deck obliterated. Having three cards left in your deck, that means you get two more attacks before the game is over, which is just massive. It, it, it slows down the combo significantly, and I think it's a very, it's a very smart change. What do you guys feel about this? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of kills the Trundle Lissandra control deck, which I think is a good thing. People will yeah. go back to playing Goodness. Feel the Rush. Um, yeah, Feel the Rush versions of Shadow Elves, Frail Yord. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I don't think Howling Abyss will see any real play. <laughs> but I, I do like, so meme cards have always felt unnecessarily bad in Runeterra, and I like that they're at least making them feel less bad. That, that's important. I mean, it does matter for Howling Abyss archetypes, but Howling Abyss archetypes are just not going to be a real thing, at least not competitively. The Watcher, yes, it's huge. And I feel like they're getting the card to where it's originally supposed to be. I think that was the idea behind the Watcher was closing out games around turn 11, 12, maybe 13, like having to play an 8 cost on 8, an 8 cost on 9, and so on which is more of the straightforward approach. And it just slows down the Matron deck so much from having the win condition represented on turn eight or nine and being very hard to interact with to, well, it can still regain board control. Summoning an 11-17 onto the board is still impactful, but at least you have so much more time to get your own win condition online if you're facing this deck. And yeah, like literally the 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 timing on which the matron deck wins does get delayed by three or four turns on average huge deal and i do agree with swim i think this one might fall out of contention and we'll see other failure shadow eyes archetypes as the control staple i love it and i think that's a great thing the fact mm. that you know maybe you have a reason to play an avia you have a reason to play feel the rush you have a reason to play war mother's call you know like it's, there should be these options and how tlc came in how this card came in originally this is how it should, this is how it should be by default i was telling you yesterday lobster the fact that it wasn't, the fact that it was how it was, for me, was the most blatant, I don't know, lack of rational decision making by devs that I've seen in this game's history. Like, how do you create this card that's so easily cheated out that just ends the game no matter what you have in your deck? You, like, it doesn't matter. I was playing Angel Draven to get to Masters this season, and it just felt so bad and so fundamentally wrong for them to just do this crazy combo and just kill me every single time on turn eight. And you just can't do anything about it. And it's really highlighted the worst things about Runeterra for me, this idea of just not doing anything for eight turns and just waiting and then just losing the game when you have and just completely polarized matchups. So I'm very happy that this happened. If it kills a card, then so be it. You had your fun for two months mm -hmm. and, you know, introduce now the, the Nivy decks and all these different decks and you have a reason to play other control options now, which I think is great. I don't think I've ever seen a card in or a deck in the game that like so many people within the community agree on in, in regards to their this stage for for the archetype. Like I, I've I've seen like so many players. Like, I I I don't think at this point there's many players, especially high level players out there that defend TLC as a concept. 
and uh, I am I am super happy that it's it, it was it, it was in case anybody is wondering why this deck was oppressive, it was basically nullifying any other control deck out of the game because uh, any other slow based deck that was not able to end the game by turn eight or nine was just going to be outpaced every single time by this build, and there was just nothing you could do about it because you were able to answer one watcher. They could just with fading memories, they could play like even two or three more, which was just ridiculous. And I love it. Three, three or four turn delay seems like a. Ma it is. It is indeed a massive nerf, but it 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 earned every aspect of that. So uh, awesome. Like I'm, I'm just so relieved because the fact that they didn't even talk about this last time around had me really concerned. That was like my biggest worry with this patch. So yep. uh, I, I absolutely adore it. So let's move on to a region that actually got a lot of changes going on. We were talking about Bilgewater a lot, but I don't think many of us expected Ionia to receive so much treatment this time around. Buffs, nerfs, all of it. I'm going to mention them real quickly. We got Ren Shadow Blade going from 3 3 to 4 3. Massive buff. Tier 1. We got Dancing Droplet. This is a big one. The Attune is removed from the one drop, which has big implications in my opinion. Green Glade Lookout. This card exists, ladies and gentlemen. It's a 2 1, like this little squirrel guy that uh, reduces the cost of your the strongest uh, unit in your hand by one every time it strikes now can actually strike multiple times without dying it is a 2-2 not a 2-1 so it, well, it, maybe well maybe <laughs> maybe I'm Might still die young witch pretty good buff as well got, having that two health makes it not die to vile feast uh make it rain now that it got buffed as well like there's a lot of pains that this thing will survive now and i think it's a massive deal will of ionia we've mentioned uh before it, it's got reverted it, it does not cost five man anymore it costs four huge deal Twin Disciplines. This is one of the biggest changes. Leeson loves this, in my opinion. Uh, going from three to two mana. Crazy buff to the card. But at the end of the day, it's one of those cases in which when you have such a low cost card, by switching it, it's, it's cost one, you know, up or down. It's, just, it's always going to be a drastic change to the card. And I think a lot of us can argue that Twin Disciplines was definitely uh, outvalued uh, by a lot of combat tricks. They got power crept like crazy. But this change is going to make it so good, in my opinion. So a big deal right there. And those are the changes to um, Ionia. Alongside Karma, a lot of attention goes towards this region. We have a, a total of, uh, I believe, um, one, one nerf actually within this. And the rest are buffs. So what do you guys feel about these Ionia changes? Which one do you think is the most impactful? And uh, yeah, just go away. There's a lot to talk about here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, pretty much all of it. I mean, I want to you know keep it keep it fairly short since we're we're running a little long here. Yeah. But I mean, I think that you know the support archetype is definitely something that people will return to trying out with uh, with Young Witch. I think that Green Glade Lookout is adorable and might actually make a little bit more sense. River Shaper used to be seen as a meme card, and then it got buffed to two health, yeah. and now it's good in a lot of decks. Um, and Twin Disciplines is a great change. Uh, me and a lot of other people have been calling that this card should be two mana for. A, for literally over a year, actually. Um, and I'm glad to see it. Yeah, the Twin Disciplines change is maybe the biggest one of the bunch, and it's mm. in line with having a very strong two-mana combat tricks that a lot of other regions have access to, like Troll Chant, like Single Combat, mm. like Mystic Shot. It might be kind of on par of it. It's interesting the, the design with the optionality it presents. I want to go a bit deeper into Will of Ionia, because I think a lot of people from back in the days have a bit of PTSD from 4 mana Will of Ionia, but I do want to say this is not going to be the same thing as back then because Will of Ionia was mainly overtuned because of certain specific deck combinations. The combo with Heimerdinger and the combo with Ezreal. So Karma Ezreal and um, Vi Heimerdinger, of course. And these decks don't exist in that capacity anymore, these completely yeah. overtuned combos. Will of Ionia is going to be a bit more of a pure control tool and um, it was almost unplayable at five mana and getting it back to four mana does make it a bit more of an option and get um, the Ionia control archetype basically a bit more onto the board. And yeah, the dancing droplet buff is an interesting one. Panda, we've been talking about this a bit yesterday. I think you have a bit more to say about it than I do. Yeah, I don't like this change at all. Uh, I think Dancing Droplet, when it came into the game, I think was a very well-designed card, and I think did a lot of things very well for Ionia as a whole. Obviously, it's been mostly in Azir Rally this past month, but if Ionia evolved into something else in the future, would the Attune, I think it would have been a fantastic card. I think it's great for deck building, for elusives, for so many different things. I would have loved to see the Attune being taken off Eye of the Dragon and not Dancing Droplet. If you want to hit Ionia somewhere, I think Eye of the Dragon is a card that's notoriously for the past year 
it hasn't been in the spotlight because Ionia has been pretty shit the, this past year, but it is a car that I think one three with the engine value it provides plus a tune, I think it has always been overtuned. Um, and I would have liked to see this dancing job being changed for Eye of the Dragon in these patch notes, but it is unfortunate. I think elusives are worse now. I think it's an archetype that, you know, there are many elusive, like there's elusives in almost every region now at this point. There's a lot of possibilities if you want to play elusive with Ionia, and this makes it less appealing. So I don't like it too much. Um, and to disciplines, I think I agree with Swim. I think this card should have been two mana from the beginning. I think it, it, it creates, it's something that fits Ionia's theme very well with this idea of like picking between attack and defense and this like trickster type uh, element to it and helps a lot of different archetypes. And and yeah, should have just always been in that staple two mana card that makes you want to play a region, makes you want to play certain uh, decks or archetypes. I think I think Twin Disciplines is easily on par with uh, with Troll Chant now because if you think about yeah. it, Troll Chant is a four stat swing. This is a three stat swing, but it gives you the option of uh, going defensively on or offensively. Like I said, Lee Sin mm -hmm. is going to absolutely adore this. It's going to be a three of it, Lee Sin, one hundred percent. It'll allow you to preserve your your key units uh, from damage, and it'll allow you to push three damage in certain scenarios where you're trying to finish as well. So this card is. Uh, insane. It's funny because this card used to be very relevant, for example, in Heimerdinger decks. But one of the reasons why it, it was good there it was because it would help uh, Heimerdinger survive and it would give you an elusive turret. Uh, having two mana spells, too many two mana spells in Heimerdinger decks, for example, um, it doesn't really make much sense because you're getting the 2 1 turret with tough, which doesn't really do too much. So even if Heimerdinger were, were to make a comeback, I don't think this would actually help him out uh, in that regard. So yeah, uh, big change and definitely agree that it's on par with uh, a lot of other, you know, region defining combat tricks. And it is definitely the most impactful one out of these. We're going to move on to the. Uh, Noxious changes. There's only a couple of them. So this will be a pretty quick one. We have Incisive Tactician which uh, Fresh Lobster learned about his existence very recently while casting the tournament. Uh, he's a 4-5, now he's a 5-5, five, five, which means that he synergizes with something like um, the uh, the four mana card, was the, the, the name, the Bloody Business, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can or be... Tra reputation can, as a whole. I yeah, think. With, the rep with the reputation in general, but especially with that one, uh, because I, I think arguably at that point, if you're, you're triggering the reputation you're playing it, you've already enabled that, so... Uh, it works well with stuff like Reckoning, for example. Like, I think this just gives you more of a reasoning to run it as a one-off. I like this card as a one-off in Ash decks, to be honest. And uh, this is a nice buff to it. And then we got City Breaker. It's a pretty cool buff. You know, it went from a 0-5. It got, like, the Braum treatment. It's a 1-5 now, which means that it can trade into things. Will it have any sort of impact? I honestly don't know, but <laughs> it's better than nothing. So, yeah, these are the two ones. What do you guys think? Uh, I think that incisive tactician. I mean, I'm just I'm just glad that it's you know actually at five attack. It, it always felt like really really bizarre that yeah. this card that was supposed to be for the reputation archetype didn't have five attack. Um, apart from that, I, I don't think there's going to be like real you know major competitive implications here. Although incisive tactician is not bad. I mean, people have been you know trying it in like you know Ash style decks as a as a one of. It's uh, all right. I also kind of remembered, I think the card art on Bloody Business is actually Incisive Tactician, isn't it? Uh, yes. It kind of never made sense yet yeah. that you couldn't cast Bloody Business on him. But yeah, it's a pretty change, especially in Ash Archetypes with Triparian Assessor as well. In Reputation Archetypes, mm -hmm. I like it. And maybe now it's actually a better alternative to Shanpo, which it did not necessarily fulfill before. City Breaker, like you said, nice little chump blocker. I still don't think the card's going to see a lot of play. City Breaker is better for when you get it from Tribeam, but not anymore. <laughs> no, don't worry, Timmy. We'll get there very soon. All right, let's move on to PNZ. This is uh, one of the last uh, regions to cover here. We, we have some big ones to talk about with PNZ and then Shadow Owls, but uh, very relevant changes here. The most relevant of all, naturally, uh, Jay Medarda with a buff from 4-4 to 5-5. Uh, tier S, in my opinion. But I, I'm, I like Jay Medarda's design in general. Uh, I, I, I think he's a fun uh, card. I really like the fact that they, they took him before. Because you, you guys are wondering, he used to be in, not for the viewers mostly, he used to be an 8-drop, right? And then he got changed to a 6-drop. He was made a 4-4. Four, four, and now that he draws you, you know, every time he's targeted, he draws you a card. I think uh, this is a massive buff to the card, even though the card is still in a very weird spot. But getting two stats is very relevant. 
and I do like it. But obviously, uh, out of these ones, you know, keeping it real, uh, perhaps one of the least impactful changes overall for the meta. As we have Minnesota Stone Kenshin going from five three to five four, we got Rummage going from one mana to two mana. This is this is crazy. This is a big nerf. And Tri Beam and Propulator going from four to five. So two two pretty you know funky buffs, but two huge nerfs for PNZ as a whole. Uh, I just want to mention real quickly, I really love this change to Minnesota Stone Kenchman. It's kind of like the, the Kato treatment, and I do think it has implications. Uh, I've always felt like this card uh, was very slow to begin with, but um, I will mess around with it. I, I like the fact that they're giving us the chance to try this out and see if it can actually you know, do things and stuff, because it is a pretty fun snowball -y effect, though the limited, the six unit limitation on, on the bench still does, you know, hold it back in that regard. And like I said, the speed of, of it, but it's surviving like three three damage uh, trades and pings is, is really important. Like it really made Kato like actually viable to a certain extent, right? But man, Rummage and Tribeam probably, that, that's really what I want to hear with you guys, because this has big, like Jinx Draven discard is gonna, it's taking a big hit from the rummage nerf in my opinion there's a lot of scenarios in which you're able to go for rummage and go for the rocket as well from jinx and i've seen that happen when they have two minutes left so many times that there's just no way that this does not impact that deck and it, I, I think easy draven will, will will definitely suffer less from it because a lot of decks even only run it as a one-off at this point but the tribe even probably their nerf i, I really want to hear you guys thoughts on this yeah, I think, I mean, these these are some of the nerfs with maybe the most competitive implications because yeah. they're hitting a bunch of decks. I mean, they're hitting Ezreal Draven, as you mentioned. They're hitting Discard Aggro. There's a lot of PNZ decks that, you know, want to be able to use Rummage. Uh, and it's really, really big deal. Like, Rummage is just not going to be the card it once was at yeah. two mana. I will say, I think I like these changes overall. Um, you know, PNZ is definitely getting knocked down a bit. I do wonder if, like, Rummage going to two might stifle a little bit of experimentation with a lot of, like, the other styles of PNZ decks that just kind of, like, want to be able to Rummage for combo pieces and stuff yeah. like that. But, I mean, th these are good changes overall, and I'm glad this meta is just getting, like, a really major shakeup. I was a bit surprised by seeing those two changes at first, but I do think it makes sense with this common theme of, like, maybe giving mid-range decks more breathing room here because Ezra Draven was notorious for being the perfect answer to all kinds of mid-range strategies. Tribeam was even starting to be splashed in Zoe Vi because it's such a big tempo swing against mid-range decks. And um, therefore, I totally understand this change to allow other decks to shine. I didn't think... Like, neither Ezra Draven nor Discard were really overtuned in my eyes, but they have been around forever and yeah. now they can just kind of make space for other decks to exist. What do you think about this one, Panda? I'm very disappointed and very sad by the Tribeam nerf. I think it's a card that really, outside of the balance and how power, how powerful it is, just the you know the value it gives in deck building. And there's been so many times I opened the deck builder and literally searched for three mana cards in random regions to see what I could make. And, and this obviously stifles that a lot. I think just the deck building experimentation aspect of it, it was one of my favorite cards in the game. I think if you want to nerf it, it could have even just you know set the default counter to zero when it starts off instead of at one, maybe that's a way of doing it. I think this nerfing to five is a pretty big deal, um, especially later into the game with, with double tribeams. And it might not be run anymore. It might obviously, Ezreal Draven, this was a big part of, of that deck being so good. And I think it was a very good deck as well. So I'm a bit sad, to be honest, by, by a tribeam nerf. I think you could have hit a card like Flock, for example, if you want to nerf Ezreal Draven, if you thought that was a tier one deck and it was too strong, they did mention it at the very start of this, these patch notes. So I'm a bit disappointed. I think they could have hit Flock to, to three damage or to two mana. Um, and especially with Swain and TF getting kind of the nerf with, or the buff would make it rain. Um, but yeah, this tribeam nerf, I'm not happy with it's, I think it's the, the thing that made me most sad in this balance. Patch. I was, I was hoping to do, you know, monster harpoon, build water, tribeam deck, uh, with control tools in this patch. And now I can't do that. So I'm, I'm quite disappointed. Yeah. Big nerfs and, and the rummage one is just. Yeah. It, it, a lot of uh, definitely hard hard to, to like I, I think I think the rummage one will have even more implications than than, than we think about yes. it for, it's yeah. just gonna be so it's massive man it's massive but we're gonna move on like I said we're, we're not trying to make this video extremely long even though I think we're going to, at a good pace considering all the changes we have to talk about as we are gonna cover the Shadow Isles changes these are big mostly for the nerf aspects because I'd argue that 
because uh, we got two buffs here with Rasa the Sunder and Dust Rider. But instead of like reducing Rasa back to seven mana, which I think would have been a very, very interesting decision for them to make, they just go with a slight stat boost. I mean, it's relevant. We're talking about a fearsome body, so going from seven five to eight six is a is a big deal. But still, at eight mana, it just feels like Rasa eventually. Ever since he got nerfed, he he never was the same naturally, and 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 then like power creep happened, and we're seeing a lot of eight drops that just do more upon entry than him. Uh, it's easier to disrupt his ability now than it was before, I think. And ultimately, I don't I don't know if this uh, stat boost will really amount to anything. And the Dust Rider just feels super irrelevant. Like yeah, it comes in as a three. I mean. It, irrelevant is a strong word, but uh, it is especially considering the the other nerf that we see here. Because uh, yeah, these are two buffs, but man, the nerfs are just wow. Like escaped abomination going from four three to four two. The the unit that curse keeper spawns, huge, huge. So many scenarios in which if you have a one drop, you're like I I can't trade into that two drop. You know I just I have my two one. And I just can't. And now you can trade into it. Because a lot of times you just prioritize blocking to the Ravenous Butcher just to be able to have an, an even trade. But now you're able to trade with a one drop into the bigger side of that combo. This is going to have like, he, this is going to be super impactful. I don't want to use the same word in implication a billion times, but that's, I don't know how else to say it because it's just like huge. And stalking shadows to three mana. Holy crap. Like that is, does that kill the card? Like that's kind of crazy. Like that's. That's really big. I mean, I, I know you swim. You play with a lot of... You mess around with a lot of uh, PNZ Shadow Owls based like burn decks in which Stalking Shadows plays a really strong role. So oh, yeah. I think I think you have a, a, an important perspective on this one. What, what do you think about this? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't this Seem supposed to be seamless. A, a seamless transition? Seamless. <laughs> You're a terrible improviser swim. <laughs> Literal fade, failing grade. Wait, wait, I got we it. had a bit of a break, in case you're wondering. <laughs> but, but go ahead, Swim. Uh, what I asked you just literally a second ago regarding... Oh, just, uh, oh, just that last second? Yeah, okay. yeah, um, so, yeah, about these uh, Shadow Wells cards. Well, I, th I think the biggest things is just, like, the Escape Abomination uh, going down to a 4-2 and Stalking Shadows, you know. It, overall, really big nerfs to Thresh and Asus. Uh, like we mentioned, top decks are getting nerfed across the board. Um, Abomination started as a 4-4, four, four, and yeah. just I, I look forward to six months from now, it's going to be a 4-1. Um, but I, I'm pretty happy about both of these. You mentioned that I play these a lot, and I, I, I do. I, I kind of love Shadow Owls and Stalking Shadows, but it is a, Stalking Shadows is a little crazy, and I, I certainly don't mind it being three mana uh, because I it agree. had some unfair interactions. I, I didn't see this coming at all, but I, 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 I wasn't like upset about it. Just want to clarify. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I feel like... Finally, the SI um, aggro package got tuned down a bit more. It yeah. has always been very high rolly and kind of frustrating to lose against those like 10 damage turns on turn three or like seven damage on turn two. And uh, this makes it a lot more interactable. And also matches that the SI shadow, um, sorry, the SI aggro package got more and more tools like the wings and the wave and the addition with Shirima, even further snowballing that early game. And I think the escaped abomination nerf is very justified. I'm a bit surprised by stalking shadows. I don't think a lot of people have been calling out that card for being overtuned, but I think um, the idea was to make it fit more into value-driven mid-range or control decks and take a bit less of the power out of aggro decks, out of burn decks, maybe even nightfall. It hits those pretty badly, yeah. but maybe Stalking Shadows originally was designed to be more of a value tool and not just an auto-include in a lot of burn decks as well. I think it's a product of the, the units it can pull out, you know, things like Doom Beast, things like, you know, Onlooker, like that, that's also the big part of it. Um, I think it's, it, I think it was a card that didn't enable archetypes, but was a great support card in so many different things. It's why Shadow Owls, with cards like Stalking Shadows, it's why Shadow Owls always felt so good to play and so good to deck build with, because there's so many different options and so many cards that make sense and, and feel strong. I would have never thought to nerf Shad Stalking Shadows. Uh, I, initially, I was kind of very against it because I yeah. think, again, it's some of these cards, it's kind of like I mentioned, Dancing Droplet, let's think about these cards that just feel strong, not overtuned, but really make it makes it so that things make sense in a deck building per, uh, perspective and all this. So I don't know. I'll have to see how it works in practice. Uh, I can't say I'm, I'm super in love with the change. I was initially very against it. Now I'm maybe more neutral, but we'll see in practice how it works out. I do think, like Lothar said, it's going to definitely hit spiders, obviously, going to hit anything that really cares about a very low mana curve. Yeah. Suddenly, it being three mana is a huge change. Um, yeah. For other decks like Deep, maybe not so much. 
Uh, although deep, it wasn't kind of super staple either at that point. So I don't know. It's a tricky one to really see until you, you see how it plays out, but definitely going to affect any kind of aggro type strategy with Shadow Isles. I'm more happy about it considering the recent uh, reveals, like this the four mana new Shadow Isles card box, yeah. that burns, because yeah, exactly. that's another mm -hmm. card yeah. that you could duplicate, and all of a sudden it's just like you know more more direct burn for Shadow Isles. So it's it's actually a relief for me. I, I think uh, slowing that down, and I, I do I do agree with with Fresh Lobster that that the uh, Diana Nocturne kind of like collateral damage there is a bit of you know it, it's a bit of a I, I, I'm, I'm, my English is failing here, but a disappointment, I guess. It's sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go with that. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely think ultimately it's a, it's a good change, and uh, it is going to allow things to freshen up as well. Um, yeah. And and I think Curse of Abomination just had to happen because there are some just like some kind of like auto win openers within, like especially like now with yeah. Thresh Nass, like Bakai Reaper into Curse Keeper into Ravenous Butcher is just an insane opener. And uh, mm -hmm. nerfing that is is a necessity, even though in a vacuum, Curse Keeper felt like it was it was actually balanced, you know, because a four three for two mana is not like it's super crazy uh, at this point, and and you have to enable that. But there's just so so much good synergies going on with that that it's just it, it had to take the hit again. I, I I hope I'm gonna go ahead and say that maybe four one won't be a necessity, but who, who knows, man? Who knows? Yeah. Like that that card is just it's always been bonkers, really. So yeah, these Shadow Isles changes very relevant. But now we're going to talk about, uh, we got Shurima and Targon left. We're going to start off with Shurima. The Shurima uh, changes, I mean, there's one that's very relevant. And uh, another one that I actually really like as well. And then uh, another one that I think doesn't really matter too much. But basically, it's Clock Hand uh, getting a <laughs> pretty strong buff. Going from a 4-7 to a 7-7. Seven, seven. We got Raz Bloodmain. Yeah, that card exists. It, it is a 6, sorry, it is a 7-7 seven, seven now. 4-7 uh, mana. And Dunekeeper, this is the big one. This is uh, one that I personally advocated for, and I'm really happy that they, they went with it. Instead of like making it a 1-1, I like that they went with the revert. Uh, it's like uh, the same effect that the, the, uh, the, the Squire, I forgot his name, like he was a 1-2 and he Squire. became a 2-1. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is the treatment that Dunekeeper got in reverse. I think this was very much necessary. This card has always been overtuned for a 1-drop, and uh, I feel like it's... It's great. Like it still got has the same stat total, but it no longer represents four damage turn and one, which is like the only one drop that actually can do that. And uh, I'm super happy about it. What, what do you guys think about? I'm also like very intrigued. What do you guys think about the clock hand buff? Because I think it's pretty pretty relevant. Like all of a sudden, this thing is threatening damage on its own as well. I mean, I'm gonna say it's relevant. I, I think it is, but we'll, we'll see. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Talia thralls, or you don't even have to run Talia. Some decks don't, but just thralls in general. Yeah. Uh, with uh, stream of Frelia, it has been a deck that's been really creeping up in the last mm. month, month and a half or so. And I mean, it's looking pretty good here. So I, th I think the clock hand change will absolutely be relevant. Um, and I mean, I, I agree with basically everything else you just said. Raz Bloodman is probably not going to make a difference. And I'm pretty happy about the Dune Keeper uh, exchange as well. Dune Keeper is an interesting one, kind of balancing the card a bit more instead of making it so much of an all-in aggro tool, also having defensive uh, pro qualities rather, mm -hmm. being able to jump block two spiders or stuff like that, um, which maybe is a bit more streamlined with something like a mono Shurima or some Shurima mid-range control decks. The clock hand buff, I feel like, is just there to counteract the Watcher nerf because the Watcher nerf was, I think, only supposed to hit the TLC deck. The Shadow Eyes combo deck, Makes and sense. they just wanted to make up for it somehow by not getting the 1117 stats that consistently um, in the Turbo Thrall stack, and instead shifting that gain of stats onto the clock hand. I think it's a fairly smart change. I think the overall power level of the deck is still going to very slightly decrease because of the Watcher hit, but the meta is going to be better for it once the Zero Relia is gone, and therefore I think it will see a lot of play and it will be strong. I think, yeah, with Thralls already being as strong as it was and with TLC being nerfed, uh, it's a big, it's a lot of stats, like plus three, kind of out of nowhere. It was already a very strong, I mean, it's obviously stat-wise not the strongest card for an 8-drop, but the effect it has um, with the right deck and, and you know, the right strategy, I think was very strong. Uh, I think it's not going to be, you know, game-breaking, the plus three, but I'm, I'm a bit surprised. I think they, they could have been, you know, maybe reducing the health of it, maybe like a 5-7, for example, I think, 7-7. I don't know. It's not going to be super relevant because you are getting hit by 8-8s and, and there's all these attackers happening. I mean, you can chump block this, but 
it is a big increase kind of out of nowhere. I'm not sure if, I hope it's not going to be a problem. I know a lot of pro players said that with TLC being nerfed, Thralls will become like kind of a boogeyman going into this next meta. And this is a big change to make if you keep that in mind as a dev. So, well, hopefully it doesn't, it doesn't backfire and it's not, you know, too impactful, but it is plus three. So it is pretty relevant. Raz Bloodmain, the same thing I talked about at the beginning of, the, of this video with the, just giving it some stats and maybe making people, it's not that going to be that much stronger, but it gives people a chance. Oh, this card exists. Let me try and build a Mithrace deck or a Fearsome deck with this card in it. Like at least some incentive to play it a little bit um, is nice. And Doomkeeper, yeah, you can block you can block Blades now and other Sand Soldiers in the Azir Aurelia mirror. Whoopie doo. And uh, that, that's all I have to say, really. I think it's, it's a good change and it makes it less aggressive, of course, yeah. but still makes it a better chump blocker and just a better two-for-one unit in Shurima. I think Raz was designed with the intent to be like a finisher alongside Kahiri, maybe. Like a mm, six mana yeah. Kahiri into this, but it didn't end up working out too much. <laughs> ambitious plans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Very ambitious. Yeah. But hey, uh, hey, any, any sort of buff is nice, but I, I do agree. Like the clock hand, I mean, if they're going to buff anything so drastically, I'm, ha I'm happy it's an A drop. You know, I think those are the kind of units that, that you know, we're all okay with seeing them uh, a bit stronger. So. Uh, yeah, but definitely out of like all these regions, not uh, besides the, the nerf, not the most um, the most quantity because the next one, like the, the final one that we're gonna talk about, which is Targan, this is wow, like this is really really impactful. There's a lot yeah. to talk about here, oh, and yeah, yeah it, it's five changes. Okay, there's some buffs, but there are some some nerfs. Some nerfs is is one way to. Put, oh my god, like the fangs one. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention them real quickly, and I'm gonna let you guys like uh, elaborate on them. Um, I'm actually gonna focus more on on one of the more fringe ones that are not as relevant. Uh, in Mountain Sojourners, which is a card that I really enjoy playing with, and I think it's a, a really strong. Uh, buff, but basically I'm gonna mention them real quickly. We got Mountain Sojourners went from a 2-5 to a 4-5. Big buff to the card. Sun Guardian went from a 4-3 to a 4-4. We got another uh, interesting buff, but not as impactful, I would say. And then we got three huge nerfs for the region. We got Star Shaping, which is gonna heal four instead of five now, uh, which is something that a lot of people have been calling for a while. And, and, and these next two, oh my god, the Serpent going from 2-1 to 1-1. This is brutal and the fangs going from very relevant to completely unplayable in my opinion as a 2-2 with life steal uh i'm gonna let you guys dive in uh, on these i'm just gonna say that the mountain sojourners uh very happy with this change i think it's very significant will it be relevant uh i don't know but i i legitimately think you can make an argument for it i will be experimenting with it like this is this is a big like this card is actually way harder to block now and uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty strong uh, buff and I, I like it, but uh, I, I know there's there's more to talk about the other one. So I'm going to let you guys go. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm absolutely in love with these changes. This is by far my favorite part of the entire thing. It's been a long time coming. It cards like star shaping, cards like the serpent. And then, you know, they just like, they added the fangs later and it's like, it was just, it was just too much, man. Um, it felt like there's just, you know, it created more polarizing matchups. And I love, you know, exactly what you're you're uh, talking about, Mogwai, which is them kind of like changing sort of how, how Targun can be played, right? By buffing stuff like Mountain Sojourners and buffing stuff like Taric, also getting a buff and just trying to like redirect uh, things yeah. into Targon's weaker archetypes from the stronger ones. I think this is just amazing. And I'm super happy not to just like have these kind of like auto lose matchups into Targon anymore. Targon for a long time has not only been the best control region or one of the best with the top end tools that you can invoke, yeah. but at the same time, it had those insane anti aggro tools. Almost all of the burn matchups were favored because of star shaping, because of the lifesteal value of the fangs. And um, the serpent change is actually huge because it hits a high quantity of cards. Yes. It hits Spacey Sketcher, it hits Zoe, it hits the exactly. fangs. Exactly. It technically even hits Mountain Scryer. The Traveler gets a bit worse and some less. Uh, played cards like start the peak and so on it's very big like this little number but like if you think about how often you see the fangs be played in every single invoked targon game this is going to have a huge right. impact just to, sorry, real quick, elaborating on what Lobster is saying, this is part of what he was talking about earlier with Swain getting better because a nerf to the Serpent is a nerf to those Invoke pools. It's a nerf to mm -hmm. Equinox because it's harder to run yeah. Sketcher and Zoe for value. And that means, yeah, stuff like Leviathan gets to breathe again. You know, I mean, Panda, what do you think? 
I mean, people, people know that I'm a, you know, number one target hater and especially after seeing <laughs> lobster play, you know, four hour games in tournaments, I cast uh, even more so. <laughs> Sorry um, about that. So yeah, this is, this is great. I think these are things that not just with the, the, you know, trying to bring the power level of things to a more closer, you know, middle ground, which is obvious, you know, not just power level, but also diversity in target, like you're saying swim, because Every deck is invoked because these invoke things are just so much better than everything else a target can offer. So there's no reason to even try going into deck builder and saying, oh, let me build this, let me build that, because it's just invokes power level is so much higher. So this is definitely a good start. Um, I think star shaping 100% necessary. Um, I, I would, didn't think about nerfing just the mountain heal, but I think it's definitely a good start. Just, I mean, we've seen it, you know, the target matches where someone's over healing to, to you know, he, over the course of the game, he was like 50 HP, really. Yeah. With Star Shaping with Karma. I saw Game Breaker playing Karma Lee Sin. That was just wild what I saw in that game. Um, the Serpent, the same as you guys mentioned, I, I included it in my balance patch survey for the first time, included creative cards in the last one I did because I felt it was such a major thing. Equinox as well was included and it has been nerfed here, which I think is um, correct. And it was voted very highly as something that was a problem. And the Fangs. I play a lot of aggro, so this is a change that I'm very happy to see. The Fangs are like the boogeyman of, of aggro in this season, I think. Anytime you shoot into Targon, you just think about the Fangs and, and how annoying that was to play against. But it is a very big change in how Lifesteal works and how this comes into the four drop. That one attack change is more massive than it might look on paper. Exactly. Yeah. And But I mean, I, I'm happy about it. I'm sorry, but that, that's how it is. And I think Targon, especially in some ends with the Felios uh, and Twisted Fate and all this, it was also very bad for the game as a whole, not just this region being strong and these decks being strong, but games going on for an hour, mobile players, you know, having to exit games probably because they're on the toilet and they can't finish it in two hours. Like this is actually a very big thing for uh, the, the bigger picture of the game and, and how it's played out and, you know, very big casual audience. So anything that helps games, again, they have to end at some point. And, and this, these changes are massive in allowing this to happen. And allowing invoke not to be you know the the biggest thing in target or maybe there to be more diversity and more room for experimentation now more incentive to experiment i think i think it's it's safe to like in, the way i see it we can call everything in in this list like a nerf and when it comes to the fangs i would just call it straight up murder like the, the card took a hit more than anything else that like that 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 hit to the power uh like you mentioned earlier uh, panda like that that one that one value is m much more in a lifesteal unit. Like the same would apply to something like Quick Attack, for example. And the fact that on top of that, one of its pools got nerfed so drastically. Like that Serpent nerf is just, yeah. it has so many implications. There's so many things that uh, Serpent could threaten now that just, it, it's very limited into what it can pick off. And it, it's mm -hmm. a big blow for Targon that I, I definitely welcome as well. Not as an aggro lover per se, but just as somebody who, you know, really, really enjoyed Rising Tides as an expansion. And uh, did not really like Call of the Mountain that much because I, I feel like Targon was uh, pushed a bit too much. Like it was, they, they even mentioned the choir. It. They even mentioned it in their like the paragraph on top before like the changes. Like yeah, we don't want Targon to, to do everything well anymore. You know, like they even knew. I I, I think I think that region uh, has always been way too much, and uh, this is this is gonna have like this is gonna be really 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 important. And ultimately, Amen, brother. Yeah, I'm, 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 I say good riddance, ultimately. I, I just want to close this up real quick by, by just having a bit of a, a minor segment or like speculating a bit about what these changes are going to amount to because uh, I think it's very difficult to really see the big picture here because there's so many yeah. things to consider. But I, I do feel like some people may be worried, for example, that Azir Irelia will not be nerfed enough. But I feel like with, with all these changes, especially with the revert to make it rain and other archetypes and the introduction of a champion like Pike that uh, I, I'm actually starting to get like I, I love the champion in the design, but I'm I'm just I'm starting to get worried that, that that's going to become the new Irelia Azir. Like the more I think about it, the more uh, Pike feels like he could be absolutely crazy. At least through through my eyes, like I just I feel like he might might be like even more broken than I really was. I don't know. Like it, it feels nutty. Uh, so uh, naturally, if a champion like that becomes really prevalent, uh, who who works or functions pretty much as a counter to that. Uh, I do think no matter what happens, basically, this meta is going to change completely. It's going to be turned on its head. Yeah. And it's it's uh, the, qu the thing is, do you guys expect it to ultimately slow down? Or or do you think we'll be closer to the mid-range scenario here? Or, or will, uh, you know, turbo fast-paced uh, archetypes still prevail? Yeah, I mean, God, it's, it's, it's an extremely complex system, like yeah. you're saying. Um, 
I just want to say, like, I love that so much is getting shaken up, you know? Like, yeah. Panda was talking about, you know, the stalking shadows nerf and stuff like that. And, like, th that's exactly how I was thinking about it. But honestly, at the end of the day, you know, Shadow Isles has just been super dominant for very literally the entire time. And I'm, I'm fine with it, you know, kind of losing its turn a little bit, even though I love Shadow Isles, right? I just, I just want to have, like, a completely different meta. As far as, you know, we're seeing... I think that Azir Aurelia will probably stick around in some capacity, but yeah. it shouldn't be tier one anymore because aggro is looking pretty well positioned and will more naturally counter it now. Um, you know, Thralls is a low key boogeyman, uh, and Field of Rush, TF Swain, and Lee Sin are probably other winners that come to mind. I want to go up to. Go ahead, Lobster. Go ahead, go okay. ahead. Going back to the question of Mogwai, I do believe that the meta is mainly going to speed up. And I think that's also what's speed why up. It, Okay. Yeah, I do think so. I think that's also what they were trying to accomplish with these last expansions, with obviously overtuning like rather tempo-oriented cards and champions. Cards we didn't talk about and that didn't see nerfs, for example, would be Merciless Hunter, Ruined Runner. Yeah. So very strong staple tempo cards um, that are just a bit above their mana cost on average value you get from them. I do feel like, and it's probably a smart thing, I do feel like Runeterra is at its best when the games are not super drawn out, when they probably do end around 6, 7, like turn 6, 7, 8, 9, and uh, are very combat-centered. Yeah. And that's why I do think they are kind of trying to enable that mid-range, that glorious mid-range meta to, to blossom and shine again. Mix in some aggro, and we did see some control tools get buffed just to keep everything in check for uh, meta-defining decks to not get too greedy or like always having to be balanced. And I do feel like um, we're going to see a significant shift in, in speed in the meta. Yeah, but but but, you, but I just wanted to ask on that because you, you said you expect it to speed up, like go faster than um, it is now or, or to slow down. Cause, like, you, I mean, yeah, compared to Aurelia Azir, of course, it's going to slow down. Yeah, because I, I I feel like the make it rain change, for example, in the introduction of uh, and the enhancement of decks like Twisted Fate Swain, and also, uh, you know, Lee Sin as well, may may lead to perhaps a bit of a s more mid rangey meta in general, right? That than what we have, because right now we have a we we have one of the fastest metas that we've ever had, right? Like uh, in at, the, at this current point, I mean, I'm I'm just I'm just thinking like because um, one of the main reasons why aggro has been so dominant is because one of the other like super fast decks was kind of invulnerable to the general counter to fast strategies, which was, you know, the Fro your Shadow Owls control base. Like, that just got capitalized on by Azir Aurelia. Uh, so I, I, I do, I, I expect, I hope as well that the meta does slow down a bit because I, I, I do agree, I don't, like, I don't like target metas that, that are just like, you know, four-hour games and, uh, you know, there's like no finishes. I also saw Swim mention a while back, I think that was a very good point, like in one of his videos talking about like how we needed more like late game finishers to actually yeah, finish. Exactly. Right. And I agree with that. But I, I want games to be finished by these big bombs and not just by a super fast paced nature and just like turbo games. Yeah. Because the problem with a super fast meta is that I feel like it takes a little bit of decision making from from games because no matter what anybody says, like playing a deck that fin aims to er finish the game by turns four and five is going to be more linear in its gameplay and what it's doing, right? So, yeah, I just want mid range, and uh, but I do agree that it's nice to see. Like I like this a drop lurk guy from from Bilgewater. I like an effect yeah. like that. I think you know that's really cool design, and I I do think it's going to be pretty good, honestly. But you know, we'll see. I don't know. But just I, wanted to say I think this past meta has been fast, but kind of artificially fast because of Azir Aurelia being fast yeah. in in it is in like in its own way, and also just all the aggro decks trying to capitalize on the twenty percent play rate Azir Aurelia also. So I think once these, it's just been a very weird meta. Very I don't know with TLC as well, just taking any control deck out of the way with TLC being weak to Azir Aurelia. It's just very weird meta where you have these very polarized matchups, mm. and you queue in with Burn trying to find Azir Aurelia. You find Dragon instead. The Fangs, you know, strike seventeen times. They heal to, to 20 and you lose the game. Like, it's, I don't know. I just thought it was one of the worst matters because of that as well. Just the oppressiveness of not allowing experimentation and the fact that so many matches were so polarized uh, as well. Some changes that didn't happen that the officer was talking about. Ravenous Butcher, obviously we saw Escape of Abomination getting a hit, but Ravenous Butcher in the future, if that continues to be a problem, I think is a card that could be a 2-2. Um, Equinox, I think is a big one. Obviously Targon got hit in many ways, but Equinox is still, I think, for things like Swain and Leviathan, a problem. Um, 
I guess shapes don't to some degree has been complained about a bit. I think it's not going to be the, the most crucial thing that hasn't been changed though. Um, sparring student, the same Lazio Aurelia being nerfed. I think it's might be fine ish, but we'll see mm. if that continues being a problem in terms of design space in the future, because we saw how broken it can be uh, in this patch and for champions, Lee Sin, Targon got nerfed in a way that doesn't really affect Lee Sin, yeah. but it makes Targon be played less, which means there's less hushes. Depending on what happens with Freljord after TLC, with Twin Disciples being added as well, with Will Veonia being added to 4 mana, Lee Sin can once again become, I mean, depending on what the mana looks like, but it has a possibility of becoming a problem again, or a very annoying card to play against, and a very card that people will be vocal against. Looking at the champions, you know, from balance, the last balance has rating, that's the one champion on the list going down. Everything's been nerfed either directly or indirectly. And Lee Sin is the one that, you know, is just chilling like, hey, I'm still here. Haven't been, have been a bit forgotten, but still can be very annoying to play against in certain metas. And that's something that I would definitely keep an eye out on to, just to see how that evolves in the next few weeks. Yeah. That's why I'm going to be playing TS Swing, just to, <laughs> to try to counter Lee Sin. I, I do agree. Like Swim earlier said that, you know, he expects, I, I, I think Lee Sin will definitely uh be oh, yeah. in a very good spot it's, it's, it's scary it's actually scary because uh he is definitely a champion that's also very because anything that goes from zero to 100 and just finishes you off out of nowhere it, it can feel very frustrating right and uh i'm 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 a little bit concerned regarding lee sin but nonetheless i think we can all agree that this is uh this is a fantastic patch like this patch yeah. delivered um, I, I don't know about you guys' expectations, but mine were blown away, um, especially with certain comments that the, some devs may have said lately, recently. Uh, I know that put a lot of, uh, I know there's a lot of negativity uh, around uh, these days, and I feel like this patch is going to surprise a lot of people yeah. because it is, man, it is something else. We have this new expansion to mess around with, but once we're done with that, there's so many cards that have been revamped that we can just there's so many things that we can explore and I really legitimately think this is more than enough to bring bilge water back into it. And, uh, we'll see. Yeah. And, and again, just keep, I'm just gonna say Pike is, it's going to be interesting. Like I'm, 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 I'm a little bit afraid because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, but, but besides that, I feel like we have an amazing, yeah, it's, it's going to be the honeymoon phase all over again. And, uh, it's going to feel like one of the most fresh po points in like yeah. lesser Ventura history for, for right. sure. This is the hands down the best patch we've ever had, um, which, you know, we ha we've had some pretty good patches, uh, but this this one's amazing. It's I mean, I think that it's, it's important to have patches that kind of time with new card releases, right? Because like the new cards get you interested, but unless there's a balance patch, things can get old pretty fast, yeah. right? But when there's a big balance patch like this that just scrambles up the entire meta, a lot of the top decks get nerfed. It will take weeks for the meta to really stabilize mm -hmm. right there will the experimentation period will last a long time because of this and i think just like combining that with the advent of these new cards is just perfect great example is that on the last expansion only one of the three new champions was really playable yeah. and the new meta after aurelia got patched in was solved after like five days or ten yeah. days or like semi-solved at least yeah because it was almost the same except this one deck taking over and it took a little bit of time for the counters for exactly um, like the aggro counters to come in especially mm. but uh yeah it didn't rattle up enough and this patch looks very promising yeah for me the biggest thing like swim mentioned is and especially this is almost going to be in, perfectly in line with davagadis's comments on reddit yesterday or the day before about incentive to play new things and incentive to experiment this is not the player's responsibility this is the devs you have to control player behavior and you have to understand that like Swim is mentioning, when you add new cards, if you don't change the top decks, people are gonna look at the new cards, be like, hmm, could be cool, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on playing as Aurelia or Thrust Master because I know this deck is already you know OP as fuck and I'm not, not gonna lose getting to masters. But the moment you change everything, people have to go to the drawing board and start looking at other options. They have an incentive to do so. And these are people that if they had this incentive before, they would love playing these new cards, but they wouldn't do it because they already have the best deck to play. So why change anything? And there's people that are like that, that don't want to experiment. They just want to play the best deck and just win. And that's why it's so important, I think. And especially some of the new cards that got, that got added, like field promotion, offer a lot of deck building possibilities, offer, you have to look at the card and go through all the regions and think, what card can I break with this card? Like those, these are cards that really incentivize experimentation this way. So I think it's, yeah, not just a great patch, but also a great batch of cards that are being added. Uh, more than in the, in the last few expansions, I think, and even maybe all the way to Rising Tides with this small release of 40 cards. I saw a lot of cards that are really offering a lot of different deck building possibilities, which I think is great. And hopefully this balance patch serves as a, as a you know, creates a default going forward, not mm -hmm. of 30 chains per patch, of course, but of 
hey, we can make these changes like Raz Blood Main plus one plus one, this change, something like that. Each one of the each patch should have at least, I think, five to six of these changes for dead cards. Just give them a little bit and at least make people have a chance to, to remember this card exists and maybe build a deck with it and maybe have a content creator make a YouTube video and it popularizes it a little bit. It's not going to be tier one, but at least it'll be played a bit more. And there's no there's no risk involved with this. Like exactly. you don't have to play this to know that giving Raz Blood Main plus one plus one is not going to break it yeah, in exactly. before the, in before the, the, it gets broken. I, but. The way I see it is just, it's such an easy way for them yeah, to just spice things up, you know, without having mm -hmm. to create new cards as well. And, and they should take advantage of, of, of yep. you know, this. And I, I just... Uh, I'm I'm really happy this happened. I I completely agree with you. I I hope this this is, sets the precedent. This is just like this mm -hmm. is where this is how things operate from now. They have said that they're still discussing, uh, you know, within like what their, you know, their design philosophy or their life balance philosophy is gonna be like. But I really really hope it it tilts in in that direction, right? Uh, and yep. and hopefully that that'll be the case because this is what I really liked about this game. You know, like I was. Yes, like it, exactly. it feels like new expansions as well. It's it's fantastic. So I think we're we're gonna call it a wrap there. You know, uh, we we did keep it under two hours, which is Whoa. you know easier said than done. Which it, yeah yeah we, by quite a bit I think because uh, it, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about here. Like it was so many cards. I'm really happy that that you stepped in Panda earlier and, and be like okay let's talk about like the regions as a whole because if we took it one card at a time, oh my oh my god. All right, but that's uh, that's gonna do it for. For, especially for me, if you guys want to say anything, uh, you know, any last words as, uh, you know, we queue out here. Uh, th for, for, my, for my end, just thank you guys for sticking around and uh, doing this. I think this was a very nice video. And uh, like I said, I, I really wanted to see multiple perspectives on what I believe is the most Im important patch for this game. And uh, I'm very optimistic for the future. Yeah, no, I mean, this it's been a it's been a dark couple of months, I think, for a yeah. lot of the dedicated community, and this is, I I think, hopefully the uh, the start of a new direction. I honestly, yeah, and you know, we we can see it with you know you, you well you, we've started doing these like progress days again, right? And you know, I I, I miss this. It's uh, it, it, it's by by it's weekly. Be, it's good to be back. Yeah, bi weekly, bi weekly. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'll it'll happen. It'll happen. But yeah, no, I'm just I'm I'm super excited for things to come. Super excited indeed. I mean, yeah, I, I do think a lot of people kind of temporarily quit the games. Was also a perfect example of this. Um, and it it feels like it's. I mean, I, I'd almost be inclined to say it can only get better. Um, and it does look like it's gonna get much much better. Also, one thing I I should mention about uh, Pike as potentially a new meta definer is that Pike at least looks like on paper he would be interactable. Yeah. You can counter him somehow yes. easily compared to Aurelia yeah. Azir, yeah. right? Pike yeah, yeah. needs to strike to really pop off. You can get mm. Tekken Brittle steals, Glimpse beyond Low freezes. health as well, yeah. Yeah, low health as well. You can just shoot him, get excited, or you can yeah. deny the spell. You can write of negation the spell. And all of that we didn't really have with Aurelia Azir yeah. because you need to play a, like, what, three, four, five mana removal card and they just bounce their yeah, hyper exactly. carry for two mana back to hand, return yeah, it for one. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell? And that's why I'm very hopeful that this meta and especially the new meta definers are going to be um, more interactable. Yeah. And it's going to allow for more creativity and deck building and a higher variety of decks in total. That being said, I do want to also say I hope that Lee Sin does not become the meta definer because that's one that still kind of lacks interactivity. Yeah. Spooky. Yeah. yeah, I think you guys mentioned everything. Uh, obviously very happy to have progress day back last episode and this one as well. Hopefully it's a more regular thing. Mogwai, wink, wink. Maybe not bi-weekly. Maybe if that's so ambitious, then at least oh, monthly, I, I think. I, I think I, we can I, do I, monthly. I, th I think bi-weekly is fine. I, All right. I can stick All right. to that. And I think the addition of Lobster is also uh, great to have, you know, uh, a proven great competitor validating our opinions is, is fantastic as well. So, exactly. so we can battle, you know, the YouTube comments, the, the ongoing war against the YouTube comments. Lobster is a we great need, addition to our army. We need someone who's not a washed up caster. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> we needed some, we needed, oh. we were all like hanging on to these achievements <laughs> from way back in the day, but now Lobster. Remember when I won the Gwent together? <laughs> seven years ago <laughs> oh yeah so that's that's my only addition hopefully it's, yeah. it's a more regular thing because i think you know it's it's very fun to do this to to have these opinions and i think mm. we have similar opinions in some ways but also differing points of views and different perspectives and i think it adds yeah even the last progress day episode i think like mogwai said maybe it wasn't like 
the most important thing in the community, but it added a lot of discussion about the game, about the, the current state of it with the, with the devs and everything, and, and maybe create some kind of reaction as well in some ways. So yeah, I think it's important to, to have these discussions and to have these honest and open and, you know, two hour long videos that they have to be because there's a lot to talk about sometimes in, in these past few months, like so mentioned, and hopefully it can be, we can continue doing this for the, the next few months as well. Awesome. So that's going to uh, do it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Uh, there will be, well, I don't know what I'm saying. There's a web in like timestamps and everything for every part. Uh, I'll uh, organize that and everything. And yeah, uh, let, me, let me know what you guys think about the balance pass. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, let me know if you enjoy this sort of content. And that's where we'll be wrapping it up. So thank you for watching. Stay tuned for daily Legends of Ventura content. We'll be back at it in two weeks. All right, I'll, I'll stick to it. I promise. I, 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 whenever I say I promise, I get a little bit of like a, <laughs> like, oh, God, am I committing again? But we'll, we'll, we'll get this rolling because I, I, I feel like this is a, it's very important to, especially with like subjects like this, to have like multiple perspectives and, uh, you know, at least a very interesting conversations. And uh, yeah. So again, thank you for watching. Have a whole day. And we'll see you tomorrow.